Hey guys, welcome to Doom Drop Pod episode two. We've got Shun here with What's a up, brand new microphone, courtesy of the fans of KCM. What's going on, man? Yeah, going pretty good, and uh, hopefully I'm sounding a little bit more sensual and sultry for you guys. Dialed in with a nice little mic setup, like uh, saying over here. Yeah, we got the professional microphone upgrade here. Sounding very, very nice. Very smooth British accent there. <laughs> Get the full well, experience. <laughs> yeah, I'll do some like uh, British ASMR streams or something. Who knows? Uh, very bassy. We got all the filters set up. We were just talking about it earlier. <laughs> yeah, Ozzy said um, like an, an hour or so before we just went live um, for the episode that something to the effect of I sounded like uh, like that, what's that guy's name? Corpse Husband or something? Like a more chilled out version of him. I don't know who is that, that is, but maybe the viewers oh, maybe know. Met, yeah, maybe some of the viewers know. <laughs> <laughs> is that a uh artist like a oh, it's musician a pop, like a like a popular streamer that like i think he actually i think something happened to him i think he like got depressed and something happened to him but yeah he was like known for like having like a deep bassy voice and ozzy said that i sounded like a more chilled out version of him hmm. it's interesting who actually ends up getting popular for streaming sometimes it makes sense sometimes it really doesn't like i've been watching yeah. the the twitch like most popular streamers recently just trying to get some ideas and like think like what can i do to improve my stream some of them are weird like there's a, a few out there who i really don't understand why they have you know 35,000 <laughs> concurrent viewers it's kind of crazy or 40,000 concurrent viewers at a time what, do you want to do you want to like put some names out there people that have kind of like got your head scratching I honestly don't remember the names off the top of my head, but yeah, there's there's a few out there. You guys probably know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, I imagine a lot of these streamers like are able to stay relevant through their own like ingenious like outside of the stream networking and stuff and mm -hmm. like, you know, understanding the algorithms and the clickbait nature of streaming to kind of know how to keep themselves relevant even if that's through like weird means sometimes that could just be as much as like stirring up drama with other streamers or something just like get some clips on like live stream fails or what have you you know do you think it's necessary to have like a persona or like a, a character that you play uh, on stream in order to be successful because i feel like a lot of these people are playing like a character to, well to define like how successful we talk in here because i mean like everyone's like measure of success is gonna be different right so i mean like if sure. you're talking like how to be like virally successful like say mm -hmm. like someone like xqc's level you know yeah. what i mean like this kind of level of success then i think yes you definitely have to at least have a more hyped up version of yourself like an alter ego that's maybe kind of you but just like on steroids you know like a more surreal version of you at the very least i think and then you have to play to that character every stream then like push it yeah people get used yeah, to it push it real good it doesn't <laughs> I, i'm realizing that you don't have to be perfect like you don't have to be uh no you know uh, if anything the opposite is true model. they want you to be imperfect <laughs> yeah if anything the opposite is true they want to see you mess up because then that's funny right they get mm. to see the human side of you as well and that develops parasocial connections and stuff which is also going to keep your engagement if they can like feel like they know the real you even if they're not actually seeing the real you they're seeing the persona you they can kind of get that illusion that they're kind of getting a peek behind the curtain once they're like watching as many of their your streams as they might and uh, after thousands of hours of watching your content eventually they're going to feel like they, they start to know this person on a deeper level and that's going to really foster a parasocial connection right yeah they're just they know a character i mean that's that's how regular relationships work too right like a lot of people mm -hmm. play a character in their job or in their relationship with their spouse you know and they're not really showing the real them it's uh, yeah, a fake I mean, version of themselves i think uh alan watts kind of talked about this a lot in his like sort of zen lectures and he kind of like touched upon the whole thing of like we're essentially just like at playing roles in this like world stage you know like we're not actually when we are not our labels we're not the person we're not the name that we were assigned to at birth or our gender or age or any other label but we play these roles in society to fit in and to function as a cohesive unit you know humans working together but 
it is still on, on some level always going to be a facade you know what i mean these are like social masks that we're wearing to to fit in and function and work together if, if everyone was just doing if everyone's just like letting the intrusive thoughts win all the time so to speak it'd be like a, a bit of a, a chaotic anarch anarchist like wet dream you know what i mean it would be kind of chaotic yeah i guess so um the whole like facade thing um this is this is something that led me like, thinking about this and, and talking about this led me down the, the path of kind of re relinquishing or letting go of ever lying you know what i mean like letting go of uh any sort of um alter ego persona um hmm. because i was listening to actually jordan peterson and some others talking about how uh when you lie a lot and you lie yeah. about small things a lot uh you end up in relationships where the person you're with doesn't know who you are like the person that they are in love with like maybe they fall in love with you you know you lie to them you tell them a lot of things um you right. kind of hype yourself up you create like a persona around yourself uh where you don't make as many mistakes as you really do, or, you know, you don't have as many fears mm -hmm. as you really do, or, you know, you just, just small lies about things in your personality um, that create a mental image of yourself in their mind. You're basically creating a separate person in their mind, and that's who they end up falling in love yeah. with, and they never really fall in love with you. And I was yeah, like... They the idealization of you. Yeah, it's it's not even their idealization. It's like the 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 person that you've made up, you know, by right. lying to them about a lot of different things. You know, that's um, that's that was the the reasoning that got me to stop lying <laughs> completely. Like, it it really really affected me actually. Um, realize making that realization, and then also, uh. Another big point that kind of hit home for me was the fact that uh, when you lie constantly, like your brain kind of defaults to a lie. Do you know what I mean? Like if yeah. someone yeah. if someone asks you a question, you're more likely to just lie about it. So like compulsive lies, yeah. kind of like a yeah, like a compulsion, and like uh, that kind of bleeds over into your. Uh, mental like your your own inner monologue so like when you're thinking about something that you need to do or you're thinking about like did I make you know what did I do wrong here or you know what can I do better or something like that or you know am I am I in the wrong in this argument or whatever um, you're more likely to lie to yourself as well and kind of lead yourself yeah. down the wrong path and those are the most detrimental lies are the ones that we tell ourselves at the end of the day and because i mean it's one thing to like have a social mask and be like yeah i'm cool shit look at me look how cool i am it's one thing to do that but if you're like genuinely like telling yourself these things and trying to convince yourselves of like a, a warped reality is happening when it's not i mean sure that might give you a sense of empowerment to like make you feel like have i don't know have some kind of pseudo hyped up self-esteem or whatever but yeah, that's a really rickety framework. And if you're just going to paint over the the rotten scaffolding of your life with a fresh coat of paint, I mean, you might look good from the exterior, but the reality is like painting over that rotten framework means it's all going to come crashing down eventually. It's only a matter of time. Yeah, and, and the the fresh exterior that makes you look good prevents you from like doing the deep work to like clean up the the frame right. the framing right like it right it doesn't only like uh, prevent people from seeing the rot the rotten inside but it prevents you from ever doing that work because you just don't have that's to the right? that's, that's the biggest, the biggest issue. issue yeah yeah and it's, that's why it's so painful to lie to ourselves right we shouldn't do that yeah yeah well i think what he was saying and what i'm saying is that the only way to not lie to yourself is to not lie to other people as well you know you have to you have to be uh you have to be mm. honest just honest in general well, in order to to well, if, avoid those 
if I'm not mistaken, I think like more accurately what he was saying was John Peterson. This is um, he does his best to try and tell the truth to his to to the be, to the best of his knowledge. Obviously, mm -hmm. we can accidentally speak untruths, right? That's that's you know, we're fallible as humans. We're going to make mistakes and what have you. But but to the best of your knowledge, telling the truth is the main thing here. Like like he's quite careful with his words mm -hmm. so much so that he's very good in debates where he can you know deflect answering a very specific question because he's good at like skirting around that but the reality is is he's very good at choosing his words because he's so careful about not speaking untruths right mm -hmm. he's thinking really hard to make sure he doesn't lie to both himself and to others around him and that's like the, the biggest takeaway from that right right just not not being casual with your speech and just letting your you know mm. your words just spill out you have to be careful not to lie i find that like as a practice not lying has made me a lot more careful with what i say because you don't i don't want to lie and then have to go back later because that's one thing i've had to do that, right. you know i haven't been perfect i've made some mistakes and like then i have to go back i've always forced myself to go back and tell the person like hey sorry uh that was not true um I didn't mean to lie or you know i accidentally lied yeah. and now i need to uh explain myself like that's hard <laughs> it's it's very hard but it actually feels great once you once you get in that habit like it feels really good to just like clear the air and just tell somebody hey that wasn't true and and even if you don't and especially when you don't have to you know like it's not even a big deal the people the person will like really take that to heart like oh wow he, he's really like serious about not lying you know what i mean it's uh it's it's well, yeah, yeah. It, it can also foster a sense of trustworthiness i mean if you're that willing to dive into your own mistakes and own them so openly and freely voluntarily is the main thing that mm -hmm. you're not even having to be confronted to come to this rationalization is the main thing you're offering this up freely right so you're both being vulnerable and you're like maintaining a sense of like high emotional intelligence because you're like saying, hey, I did this thing that wasn't cool. And uh, yeah, by volunteering that, you're like taking all the sting out of it as well because there's no necessary confrontation. You know what I mean? Like you're able to like deal with it in a very chilled out way. And that person probably feels more trusting of you because they're going to think, okay, maybe in the future, if there's other problems, like I might not even have to do much heavy lifting. Maybe this person can do the introspection required to like, you know, figure shit out on their own. I wouldn't have to like, you know, make much effort in this relationship as far as like the confrontation and issues are concerned. I think it does follow, does uh, foster some trust. And uh, that's, I mean, being a trustworthy person is uh, a huge benefit for sure. Just but I also think that the, the, the main thing here is the, the, the trusting of the self, not so mm -hmm. much getting the other person to trust you, but being able to trust yourself. Because if you yes. can trust yourself and trust your word, you're also fostering like a sense of not only independence, but like self-assuredness. Because then a lot life's challenges will be much less daunting if you feel much more capable in tackling them honestly, right? If you, mm -hmm. if you can be introspective and honest in how you're dealing, not just like, oh, everything's fine. The house is on fire, but everything's fine. You know, you've not got this like kind of like you're not glossing over the problem are you like yeah. if you're actually doing the introspection properly and being honest with yourself that's fucking powerful man like not much can can topple you if you're able to do that sincerely that's the goal that's right. the that's the uh yeah the prize for going through the the difficulty of not lying you know what i mean that's difficult yeah. man sometimes to not lie to just have like the you know the, the very easy way not to take the easy way out ever is very difficult yeah i i can i can agree to that um i also think it's good in relationships where by being your authentic self in that regard where you are not trying to get people to like you by making yourself out to be something or not or what have you i also feel like that really does foster genuine connection with people because you you're then kind of filtering out the people that won't like the real you with the people that will and then you'll have healthier connections and relationships because the people that stick around to actually like vibe with you are going to be people that actually like you not not like you for these superfluous like like mirror images of yourself that aren't even real you know like we were talking about just now that's right
and people are more likely to tell you the truth as well i mean people mm -hmm. of course will lie to you um even if you tell them the truth 100 percent of the time but i feel like they're more honest when you're being honest all the time and it, it really yeah. helps it helps it helps them to to kind of like match you you know what i mean like they'll they'll make more of an effort to be honest it seems just from my experience but um you know yeah i feel like i feel like there is a kind of like underlying transactional nature to a lot of relationships even though it's not necessarily healthy or like should be the goal of the relationship but it does seem to follow that you get more of what you put out in the world in the sense of you know, if, you, if you're a toxic piece of shit to your girl and you don't give her any emotional availability, I, I really fucking doubt she's going to do the same for you unless there's some kind of trauma bond where because you're being a toxic piece of shit and being avoidant, she clings to you even more kind of thing. But if that was not the case, then yeah, like, like attracts like. So I feel like by being more honest and open, you're going to attract people that will either be more comfortable doing the same with you or just attract that type of person to begin with. Well, I know you wanted to talk about relationships today, Shun. What, what, what did you have in mind, man? I got your your information, but um, I wasn't sure what you, what what well, direction you wanted to take this conversation. Re relationships, yeah, but more specifically, the connections of those relationships. It doesn't necessarily have to, like, you know, be limited to um, romantic or friendships or anything, but just human connection. But I guess we can look at it through the lens of relationships. Um. I, I want my my presupposition or hypothesis is basically that I think there's like a, a trinity or a triangle of fundamentals or pillars required for fostering those healthy, lasting friendships and connections. And that's in the form of the three points being attachment styles, love language, and shared values. And I wanted to go into those three things in detail. I like where this is going. Go on. Let me know. <laughs> okay so we'll start with attachment styles so speaking in like pop psychology terms uh, that'll certainly be easier for most of our listeners who's probably been exposed to some of this talk before uh, so the attachment styles so you've got anxious avoidant and secure so for the purposes of this we could imagine the anxious person being the the clingy girlfriend or boyfriend who say you know is kind of somewhat dependent on the happiness of their partner Certainly, kind of like a sense of codependency to, to function like uh, their happiness is kind of tied with their their relationship partner and as a result that can usually manifest itself in the other partner becoming more avoidant which is the other attachment style which is basically like if there's some kind of confrontation and there's an argument that erupts the avoidant person is much more likely to be like right i want to leave right now i just want to go i don't want to be here the anxious person is much more likely to be like no no please stay i want to talk about this Whereas the, the secure attachment style, the third one, is uh, basically where you have like a sense of independence and you don't actually need any kind of like reassurance or what have you, not, not, not in the extreme sense. Obviously, you still want emotional support and connection, but day to day, you don't need to know that person's okay to feel okay. You can go about your business, they can go about their business and there's no issue. Hmm. Well, I was thinking about... Um relationship look maybe you can maybe you can uh take this relationship i'm about to describe to you and characterize oh. it um with with this lens potentially so i've been thinking about this relationship a lot it's been very near to me for a long time is a relationship with let's just call it a friend of mine who okay yeah who got divorced recently and uh he was in a long relationship. I think they got together when he was like 24 or something like that. And uh, they got married. And I talked to him after the divorce. And he said that the main reason that he got married to her, because they didn't have mm. a lot of the shared values, right? They didn't have a lot of the shared interests. The reason he got right. married with her was because um, he felt that she would never leave. And I feel like a lot of people, a lot of people uh, who are uh, out there who are getting married today are in like a kind of a weird, it, they have like a weird attachment problem where they're right. scared that people will leave. And so they end up 
dating and marrying people who are they believe are kind of below them do you know what i mean they feel like that person is yeah, like exactly less I mean. less than what they um you know bring to the table like less attractive less uh, wealthy you know less interesting they they pick somebody like that because they think that that person will never leave them can you can you uh characterize that with with what you just said yeah so this is this is going to be the framework of like really unhealthy relationships by the way because yeah. i'm going to tell you right now you want someone that's willing to leave you in fact you want someone if anything that's willing to leave you in 30 minutes flat from you doing something that's totally heinous you mm -hmm. know what i mean you want someone that's prepared to walk away and the same as you should want someone that you can walk away from because then you at least know you're going to be operating from an authentic framework if you if you go forward with the mindset of I don't want this person to leave or I don't want to leave this person. You've already set yourself up to fail. Doesn't matter what doesn't matter if you're in the masculine frame, feminine frame, doesn't matter. That that's completely irrelevant. All that matters is that your mind is on uh not wanting to be abandoned or not wanting to abandon someone and then you're fucked after that. Cuz like then you will operate from that framework and you will not be able to be authentic with that person. You won't be able to give them the kind of feedback they need. Sometimes it's going to need to be negative feedback. Sometimes you gotta, you know, you gotta have a bit of teeth. Not not in the sense of being toxic, but you, you gotta be critical when the time is to be critical, right? You can't always operate from the framework of I wanna act in a certain way so this person doesn't leave me. And the same as like you don't want a partner that will never leave you because then that just gives that just enables you to be a, mm. a an unfulfilling partner as well and just create a toxic environment. If you're genuinely believe that this person won't believe you, do you honestly think you're gonna treat them well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, it, it sets up a situation where you can really take advantage of that person um, when, right. they, when you know that they are not going to leave you. But the funny thing is that the, the people that you think are not going to leave are usually the ones that end up leaving. Like, she, she left him, right? Like, it's, right. Uh, but that's because, this is because he acted in such a way yes. where he thought she would never leave. And yeah. then she left because he acted that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Like, you need to find somebody who is, who doesn't need you to be there, who doesn't need, you know, that, um, or who isn't like reliant on you for everything, right? right? Who is not reliant on, um, your affection, your love, your money, your whatever. It just like they need to be sort of independent, at least to the point where they're capable of leaving so that you can, you know, act as though, the what you do in the relationship actually matters that they mm -hmm. might leave right and then also you have the ability to leave so you're not thinking about like uh, i have to do this thing otherwise they'll leave you can just act the way that you would act and you don't have to just hope that they're not going to leave you know you, you just you could be more secure secure attachment style obviously the best guys so we're trying to yeah. say yeah and and just so you know, like one of the biggest issues with this pop psychology is it's very easy to put the point the finger at your your spouse or significant other and be like, oh, it's because you're avoidant that this relationship is the way that it is. Because every time we have an argument, you want to walk away. That's the problem. You're just too avoidant. Like the problem is, is that you're not looking at yourself enough because a lot of the times it's, it's the your attachment style is enabling and reinforcing their attachment style. So the more anxious you are, the more avoidant they will be. The more avoidant they will be, the more anxious you will be. And it creates a toxic dynamic and a push-pull dynamic between those two forces, much like a magnet that repels another magnet. The more the anxious person pushes, the more the avoidant person you know, avoids and is uh, repelled and uh, creates very unhealthy toxic dynamics but that's not like to say that it's unfixable an avoidant person or an anxious person can gradually work and on themselves and become more secure so it's not like you're, you're fucked or anything but like i was saying about this trinity of fundamental things there's a lot more that goes into it and from the sounds of it that relationship was doomed from the start just because of the lack of shared values yeah shared values are super important um but yeah. those come in different forms though like i would say that comes in the forms of your beliefs or your shared goals or your united vision like i mean it doesn't necessarily you don't need much to build that's the thing like to have a good relationship it's not like you need like the perfect everything the stars to align the you know the perfect girl or whatever like that's, mm -hmm. that's not true like you just need something to work with just some kind of shared goal or shared values just a few things 
And then from that framework, you then can build the perfect relationship using that as the bedrock. But you can't build the perfect girl. Let's let's make no. that clear. You're not. You're, no. We're not in the business of uh, changing people. That's not uh, our really our um, <laughs> life. Demo. Yeah, that's that's not what humans are here to do. We're not here to make other people into better things. You know, we're 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 on this earth to manifest our own destiny. And um, if you are like disappointed. You know, you're not happy with how what a person is, then you shouldn't be with them, um, because right. you're not gonna change their, change them. And I've seen so many people go yeah. through incredibly rough, terrible relationships, thinking that they're gonna be able to change the other person, and it's just not, it's not doable. Like maybe what you're saying, like you're saying about like avoidant or uh, attachment style. You know, maybe they can become stable in the future. I would say that that's n almost not possible when you're already inside of a relationship. Well, they're already in the yes, yeah. because by that time they've already created a trauma bond in some way, shape, or form. It's usually impossible to break free from that trauma bond while you're in the trauma bond. So usually you have to do a, a full detachment, and depending on how big that trauma bond is, that could take any time from a few weeks to a few months to maybe even years, depending on how well you're able to do the introspective work and whatever to to get over it. And some people don't get over it for a long, long time. And when you know you have gotten over it is when you're you're not obsessing over that person all the time. So you're not thinking about them anymore and stuff. And it's kind of hard to do that when you're in the relationship, right? Yeah, for sure. It's uh, super necessary to change in order to change yourself. Um, and the way that you approach relationships is to, to let go of your relationship. It's so hard to change when you're already in one. So difficult well, yeah, to, to change the patterns. <laughs> Because basically the definition of being secure in your attachment style means you're okay being alone. That's mm. the whole point. You're okay with yourself. You're okay being alone. You're okay with these things. That means you're able to attach securely to other people because you're not dependent on other people. And that's the catalyst here. If you're not able to be okay with yourself, being alone, doing your own thing, then you're not able to securely attach to anyone. Anyone. It's a, it's a funny word to use, secure attachment, because it's with basically being okay with not being secure right exactly you're, you're with yeah, some you're no. with someone there's no security you just kind of accept that like okay this person could leave at any time i can leave at any time let's just work on making it the best relationship possible the most honest the most like loving and caring relationship possible and if it doesn't work it doesn't work you know you just yeah. you just accept I mean, this it this is a pretty like toxic way of framing it, but like for guys out there that are like not that experienced, like one like rule of thumb you could follow when you're dating someone, not when you're in a relationship, but when you're in the dating phase of getting to know someone, you what the mindset you want is I need to be able to be comfortable walking away from this person within 30 minutes of a negative interaction. If you're not capable of walking away from a person completely after 30 minutes of something negative enough happening, then you're not going to be operating with an honest enough framework to actually like attach to someone securely because you're going to be smitten by this person to the point of you're going to ignore all the red flags and not really understand what green flags you're even looking for and you're going to get all tangled up in all kinds of like manipulative webs potentially if you don't have that mindset of being prepared to walk away especially when you're getting to know someone in the early stages if you're a young person and you're trying to date man it's it's uh it's rough out there that's brutal man it's um yeah it's a strange landscape but um i would say having more relationships can get you to, you have to be able to have a few relationships and like get heartbroken a couple of times before you can have that secure the secure attachment style i feel like the first time you fall in love the first time you meet someone and you're like really smitten by them is so hard to to remain detached yeah it's uh um, 100 it's it's so easy to fall into like the anxious trap 
I've done it myself, you know, like no mm. one's perfect. I've been in so many relationships where that's kind of been the thing where it's like, I've lost my framing of like how I should be operating. And instead I just get attached to this girl because she's super fucking awesome. She's super fucking funny. She's good in bed. Everything's so cool. It's like, ah, oh, maybe she's like going to be the girl I end up being with for a few years, guys. And it's like, I have that attitude, right? But mm. the reality is, is that maybe this person isn't the perfect person. Maybe it's just the first few months are super awesome because she's super good at getting people super into her initially. Mm -hmm. maybe she's anxious and she wants to go the extra mile to get you hooked on her and as soon as she knows that you're hooked on her and won't leave her then she can start the cycle of abuse and start treating you like shit gradually but she's not right. going to do that initially necessarily right and that's the problem if you go into it with that framework of ah oh, she might be the one i'm not gonna ever leave her then you're fucked because you give away all your power and leverage and then she can start treating you however she wants and you're just going to be trying to fix things and get things back on track and not even thinking about what she's doing you're going to be worried about you making her happy or whatever the case may be. Are you going to be putting the blame on yourself? Like, why is she so yeah. upset? It's my fault. That type of stuff. Everything was perfect in the beginning. It must be me. Right. Yeah, this is, um, this is a trap. It's a trap. I think everybody falls into. You don't have to feel bad about yeah. it. You just have to get out of it as quickly as possible and you know, realize the mistakes that were made and try to like do better in the future. Try to learn how to be more secure in your attachment style. Well, let's talk about the third pillar here of the Trinity. I was talking about the love language. Um, I'm sure most viewers here have heard something what we're, t what we're talking about now. Like there's like basically five main archetypes or umbrellas of love language. That's gift giving, words of affirmation, acts of service, physical touch, like intimacy, and quality time, you know, time spent together. So saying me saying those five things, like, what do they mean to you? Like, how would you describe those? Or give me some examples of those things in action during a relationship? Well, gift giving is pretty straightforward, you know, buying things for the other person or making things for the other person. Um, right. Acts. What, what did you say was the second one? Acts words of, of affirmation. Words of affirmation. Okay, that's like, you know, telling someone you love them when you're leaving the door, you know, uh, saying nice things to them, telling them they're beautiful, telling them they're handsome, you know, like giving them positive reinforcement when they're doing good things. Mm -hmm. um, the other one was acts of, acts of service, like taking out the garbage, doing things to help them, you know what I mean? Or, you know, taking care of the house. Um, that's that, That's what comes to my mind immediately is like, uh, for instance, I usually do the dishes. It's like that's kind of like an act right. of service, like to always have that done. Um, you know, to to clean the house, those type of things. Um, and what kind of reaction do you think, like, say, yeah. your significant other? Let's use your wife for this example, since it is, you know, you're in a relationship. So when you do something like clean the dishes, like, what do you think that does for your wife? Like, what do you think is like her emotional reaction to that? I think it's just the the absence of something that she has to worry about, right? Like I'm like clearing a path mm. so that she can, uh, you know, get on with her day, like cooking or, uh, you know, making something, uh, tea or whatever. It's just there's not like this uh, road bump of looking at um, a bunch of dirty dishes. You know what I'm saying? Like this, yeah. I'm just like clearing, I'm clearing a path. Do you know what I mean? I'm like clearing out mm -hmm. her mental, like the, the garbage that is coming her way. You know what I mean? I'm like, th right. this is it, in this way. It's like a service. It's like, I'm, I'm serving myself and her in our relationship. You know what I mean? By doing the things that I'm supposed to do. This is like acts of service in my mind, but that might not be. I'm going to Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, no, no. I'm going I'm to circle back to that in a minute. I'm just going to cover the other two first quick. So now what do you think about the physical touch and quality time? Uh, I think that's pretty straightforward too, right? Physical touch is um, hugging, kissing, uh, and acts of affection like that. And then uh, the quality time is, you know, sitting down, actually talking with the person or going for long walks, uh, conversating, you know, mostly, mostly that conversation. Uh, aspect or or like doing something together you know doing a hobby together or doing a sport together something like that it's like quality time with just being around the person okay. are you are you comfortable talking about what you think the love language dynamic is in your relationship with your wife like what do you think your love language is and what do you think her love language is 
Um, I would say my love language is, I, I mean, I think we do all of those things, both of us. In terms of hierarchical structure, like what would you say are like the one or two most important ones for you? And what the most like, because obviously this is going to be like order of preference. Like this is the most important to me and this is the least important to me. So what order are those for you in terms of most important and it, what you think the most order of importance are for her? I would say probably for both of us the quality time one <laughs> quality time okay. is probably the most important for both of us okay yeah I'm not sure on that but yeah that's just my feeling it's like just oh. uh, spending some time together every what day you say? Do, you, do you think there's a bit of misalignment the further it goes down like do you think it's like a little bit mismatch for the, uh, the alignment of the second and third most important things or how do those line up no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Maybe, you know, maybe um, the quality time is more important to her, but um, okay, that's that's the yeah. I don't know. Maybe the the one like service might be more uh, important to me, right? But um, yeah, it's hard to uh, it, it, you know, it's never equal in any relationship. There's yeah, never an equal. Not. I mean. You say usually, but I would say it's 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 pretty much always there's someone who <laughs> who's like loving more in different ways. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, yeah. it usually does go that way, hundred yeah. percent. Um, it's it's almost impossible to find. I'm not saying impossible just because it, I guess it's theoretically possible, but yes, it's relatively impossible for there to be like a complete fifty fifty split down the middle. It's just mm. almost theoretic. The main thing is that you're both working towards it together. It doesn't matter if it's sixty forty or fifty five forty five, whatever. But yeah, and it might be like she's slightly more quality time and you're slightly more active service, and mm -hmm. but she's still maybe a little bit active service and you're a little bit quality time, so it still kind of meshes. It doesn't have to be perfect, mm -hmm. right? The idea is that it's just that there's some compatibility. Like you're both quite a bit valuing quality time and you're both quite a bit valuing acts of service, and that's where the compatibility comes from. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? Yeah, and I think the important thing is as well is that like you don't need any of those things. You know what I mean? Like it's you're not like relying on that person for your right. words of affirmation. You know what I mean? You're not relying on them for uh total, totally for affection. Like if they don't have that today, you know, they're not able to give you their, their words of affirmation today or the affection today. It's mm -hmm. like, it's, it's okay. You're going to be fine. You know what I mean? You don't break down and lose, lose your head and, you know, blow up the whole relationship if you're securely attached if you're securely attached if you're able to yeah yeah the things that some things are important you know there's uh to you but they're not like do or die every single day do you know what i mean there's there's people yeah, i've exactly. dated who are like if if you're not telling me i love you today it's like things are falling apart you know what i mean like they're they're gonna explode the relationship <laughs> usually there's a lot more going on there so usually mm -hmm. this could be there there, there may be a, a cluster b personality type they might have bipolar disorder or bpd or something um this means they they lack the object permanence in their relationship to see the relationship as this like complicated thing where it's like existing over all space and time they need that like day-to-day -day reassurance because they don't have that object permanence of realizing hang on a minute over the grand scheme of things, this relationship's really good. It's just that we're having a rocky day because he's not feeling good today. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Or whatever the case may be. They don't have that object permanence required to be able to be like, oh, okay, he's just having a bad day. Like, I don't necessarily need to worry about the fact that he's not saying how amazing I am today. That's okay, because usually he does. You know what I mean? They don't have that ability to do that. Right. So let's talk about um, acts of service. I'm interested to hear what you say about, uh, like, how far off am I with what I said? About what I don't think you're. Are. I don't think you're you're far off necessarily, but I would say that maybe you haven't even thought about just how powerful this stuff is. Like, I would even go so far as to say, depending on how much she values acts of service, it's even possible that you turned her on by doing something like that. Mm. I mean, like, unironically, like, made her horny, like, because like, if that is part of her love language, it's not so much that um, the the physical act of you doing the washing up it turns her on. It's like you're communicating your love for her with that act of service, right? Right. And 
not for all girls, but yeah, some girls would be pretty turned on if they came home and like the guy had like taken care of all the dishes and did the housework and shit. Like, some women are wired that way. So I'd even like go even one step further. I don't think it's even just a matter of like, oh yeah, she comes home and she's like, oh, I don't have to do that. That's cool. I get to relax. I think that 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 potentially is even like enough to spark intimacy and like yeah. All right, so I I kind of had it in my head, I guess the 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 right kind of um, thinking yeah. in there for acts of service. I, I don't know. I I feel like that's something that I've evolved over time throughout relationships. Like it um it's definitely like a key point of my style of relationship now is like i try to i really try to do those things do you know what i mean because i know that mm. um it it's it's like really important to to your partner to to see that you're actually you know caring about the house caring about the the um stuff that they have to do do you know what i mean trying to like well, yeah yeah Especially if that's, say, for example, the, the hierarchy was structured for her, just for argument's sake, that she really didn't value words of affirmation, just for argument's sake. Okay. Like, say she didn't do anything for her. Like, you say, like, oh, you're amazing, babe, you're beautiful, all that. And it just, she kind of, like, likes it, but doesn't really do anything for her in terms of, like, you know, feeling that you love her. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it might be that but she needs that act of service because it's, like, a physical manifestation of your love. Maybe words don't do it for her. Maybe it's, like she sees the the words through action more and it it could be that she needs that other manifestation of love to even believe you on a deeper level and just the words alone like the affirmation wouldn't cut it whereas for someone else maybe they do care more about the actual words because it's like they trust you enough that you are speaking your truth when you do say them so they still have that gravitas so when you do say these nice things to them it does still hold that emotional weight so to speak mm. So if you're lacking in, in certain areas, then it might take away from the other areas of... Yeah, that's of, the thing. Um, that's where the lack of compatibility can come from, right? Because mm -hmm. say if you're like... Say if your girl's like really super insecure and like hated how she looked and like always like looked in the mirror and said, oh my God, I look so fat or my ass is flat or whatever the case may be, like, yeah, you, you can sit there and boost her up, pep her up and say, nah, you're beautiful, babe. I love you. Like, at the end of the day, it's not going to do anything for her. And like 10 minutes later, after being hyped up by you, she's going to feel shit again. And it's like not going to do anything for her. If that's not her the way of like, she, she won't believe you. Like she 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 hear the words and process them, but deep down, she's not going to believe you. You know what mm. I mean? It's not because she doesn't trust you. It's just she physically can't. It Does, doesn't work for her. Right, right. But maybe she's more physical touch. So maybe you don't sit there and say, oh, you're beautiful, babe. Maybe instead, when you go and take the the rub the trash out, you you know, you go up to her, you kiss her on the cheek, give her ass a little squeeze, give her a little hug and whatever. Do whatever she's into, snuggle her, nuzzle her, you know, whatever. Like some kind of physical intimacy instead of the affirmations that you know she's not about or whatever, you know, whatever the case mm. may be. Hmm. And that will make her feel sexy and loved and blah, 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 without you having to say anything. Right. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think that I or my my wife are, like, lacking in any of the areas. But, um, this is, this is what I've been, this is what I was looking for when I was trying to find a, a partner, was someone who is right. more balanced. Because I've had a lot of bad relationships with a lot of people who are completely out of whack in in different areas, and um, mm -hmm. personally, I feel like I'm I'm quite balanced, and I need like it's glaringly obvious when someone else is out of whack. You know what I mean? Like if yeah, when you are a very like uh, secure attachment style with a balanced personality when you meet somebody who's really like highly anxious or highly um uh, what, what was avoidant. the other one? avoidant there you go um it's like really crazy you know you you feel the crazy like you're being sucked into the crazy whirlpool you know what i mean yeah <laughs> you yeah. can feel like they're they have like a gravity to them that's like sucking you into 
Well, they're trying to polarize you right. subconsciously. They don't even, even recognize that they're doing that, but they're trying to polarize. If they're anxious, they're trying to make you more avoidant. If they're avoidant, they're trying to make you more anxious. Simple as that. And you can feel yourself kind of slipping into their insanity, you know? And even if they're not insane, they're just, just the way that they are um, executing their relationship is like, this is not healthy at all. But you, you know, if you get too deep, to. if you get too deep, you become like that, right? Like, right. Exactly. Even if you are like a normally balanced person, if you get too deep in a relationship, you will become like an anxious one. You know, you will become that thing that you you weren't initially, right? Like, it's mm-hmm. uh, it's it's a slippery kind of whirlpool situation. You know, you're being flushed down the toilet. You're spinning around the rim you know and you can feel it <laughs> you can feel it like the the vertigo of being you know flushed is uh it's it's real and i i've learned to kind of like avoid it to to like it, without sounding like an avoidant person to to just like oh well this is what's happening Let, let's get the hell out of here we're not we're not down for this type of shit Right. Well, that's not necessarily being avoidant. That's just like, you know, having the self-esteem to identify when something's not going well. And, you know, in a way, you're like also doing the other person a favor by not perpetuating a toxic cycle. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, but the problem is, is that a lot of these people will keep going down this rabbit hole. Like anxious people will keep finding avoidant people and avoidant people will keep finding anxious people. That's just because it is a natural pairing. It's like it is like two magnets coming together and it's very alluring. It creates this natural push pull. Tech, tech um, dynamic where, if anything, this is actually the technique that a lot of like uh, pickup artists and like toxic uh, guys will actually employ on purpose. They'll actually try and right. deliberately set up this uh, dynamic of push and pull because it is so alluring. Because it's this, this like, you know, you're, you're, you're on the one hand, it's like, you know, you're giving them a carrot and a stick. So it's like keeping them guessing. So you're like a mystery, mysterious guy. And it's also creating this like need for your approval and attention because when they they are feeling good they feel amazing and they want that back as soon as they get that taken away from them mm-hmm. and uh yeah and it, on a natural like organics framework it doesn't quite happen that way but it, it's very it can happen over a long period of time like we like you were just saying about you can you can be secure and get into a relationship with these people when so say the if you're a secure person with an anxious person like that's going to make you more naturally avoidant because this mm. anxious person is going to cling on to you for dear life. And you're like, hang on a minute. I've got my own shit going on here. I haven't got 12 hours of the day to dedicate towards chilling you out. Okay. Right. I'm okay. Can you not be okay? It's going to make you more avoidant. And then, and vice versa is true. If you're secure, but they're avoidant, you might then eventually it might take you a year, but eventually you might start wondering why is this person acting so aloof with me? Mm. Is something going on? Did I say something? Like what's going on? Eventually right. you might become gradually more and more anxious because you're wondering what the fuck is going on with this person. Right. And then that's how the site, that's how you can be easily flipped and polarized. The key word here is polarized happens, not just with your attachment style that happens with your, your masculine framing as well so when you're in a relationship with a girl and you get more comfortable with her so you don't really care as much about how you're presenting yourself or whatever and you start letting her do whatever the fuck she wants or whatever but eventually you're going to become less and less masculine at least in her eyes and that might make her feel less and less secure in the the, the sense of she feels less secure to be herself so she feels like hang on a minute maybe i don't feel so stable in this relationship she might become slightly more masculine and then the, the scale of masculinity and femininity might shift and become polarized where you become more feminine and as a result, she becomes more masculine. But that's a totally different like linear spectrum right now. Like the main issue that I want to talk about is the attachment style shit, because I think that is like the catalyst to creating a healthy relationship to begin with. And I think most people get one of these three things wrong. They maybe have a, the attachment style down, but they haven't got the right love language or they've got the love language down, but not the right, they haven't got any shared values or beliefs or any kind of united vision. That's the problem. I feel like you really do need all three things, at least mostly covered to even have a chance at something that's like long lasting and fulfilling. I feel like you can get into like two, three year relationships being unhealthy. I think you can have anxious avoidant relationships, which seem like they're pretty chill relationships because you naturally mesh because them being anxious helps you being avoidant and vice versa. It's kind of like a enabling dynamic where you can both 
be this unhealthy thing and feel like everything's okay it kind of gives you gives you both like a sense of like dopamine and esteem as well almost because the avoidant person gets to feel all important because this anxious person is chasing after them and the anxious person gets to feel good when they finally get that attention from the avoidant person they so crave right well i don't know where you're going with this where where are you going with this <laughs> i'm actually going when i'm actually going all the way to i think attachment is the root of all suffering sam all right so you're you're going buddhist on us then hey oh yeah we're going full on zen buddhist if anything not hindu buddhism zen buddhism yeah attachment being the root of all suffering and that's i think the problem with the human condition in general i think it's a a good stoic principle as well right it's like the acceptance of death the acceptance that, that you don't really own anything in this life it's it's really talking about attachment right that you're not attached right. to any of these things that you're r just realizing that there nothing is permanent object permanence doesn't exist right yeah. everything everything well, is in a transitionary sure state yeah but i think that detachment is possible it's just that it requires like a metaphorical leap of faith you can imagine yourself clinging to a cliff edge with your fingers like tightly holding on for dear life and you've got this fear that you're going to fall down into this infinite void below you but it's actually an illusion if you let go of that cliff edge you don't actually fall you just kind of like hover there and like just chill there and you're like hang on a minute nothing to be afraid about all along but you need that level of introspection to first foster self-understanding and self-love after you've done the initial healing process of processing your trauma or whatever it is it's not like you can just like flip a switch and like let go you need to do a little bit of groundwork a little bit of introspection and treat yourself with some kind of degree of empathy like treat yourself the same way you would treat like your own five-year-old child or something like imagine there's like literally a child inside of you and start talking to yourself as if you would talk to your own child that you loved not just that you're it's your own child but your own child that you actually genuinely loved and want to nurture you just start talking to yourself more like that first well, let's let's give a little example here about uh, attachment and like the detriments of attachment because I I have a good one like my oh. uh, my friend who got divorced that I was talking about earlier, um, I was talking to him about downsizing because he bought a massive house, um, you know he's got a lot of money, uh, he has a lot of toys, he's got you know boat and all kinds of different stuff. And I was talking to him about like, hey man, you're divorced. Um, why don't you sell the big house and get something smaller nearer to your uh, ex-wife? You know, somewhere that's uh, just make things a little bit easier for yourself. Do you know what I mean? Like, let's get rid of some of this stuff that you've been clinging on to. You know, you when when he was um trying to make the relationship work he, you know he w bought all this stuff so that he could have kind of like the perfect life you know he kind of set himself up with right. money getting the wife getting the kids and then you know having the big house having all the toys and like you know he expected happiness to come from that right he expected to be in a great position where he's got this all the things that you could ever want right and if anything, he's setting himself up to fail because as soon as he attains all those things, he'll be depressed. That's why there's lots of people out there in sports cars that want to drive that sports car into the next tree. It's the same why there's athletes out there that get like gold medals and now they're like depressed because their entire lives were geared around getting those gold medals. Now what? Right. So as his as his marriage was falling apart, I was telling him, you know, you should move. You should sell the big house and move somewhere else because the wife wasn't happy in the big house um and you know he was saying that when he was young he didn't really have a lot his family was kind of poor and so he always wanted to have a big house and he wanted right. his kids to grow up in a nice place um and have all the things that, that he didn't have when he was wealth. a kid yeah so that was his measure of wealth and you know he was trying to buy happiness and he still hasn't sold the house. He's still holding on to it. He's still attached to it. He's like, 
not able to let go of those things and it's really the root of all suffering um yeah. in the literal sense because he is you know so attached to this idea of having these things and so he's like basically owned by the things that he owns like that's a big part of yeah. stoicism is like we don't own things things own us right things you own end up owning you that's exactly. fight club as well yeah yeah fight club talked a lot about that or at least tried to drive that point home yeah i think I, even tyler durden says that like that quote exactly where he's like the things that you own end up owning you i think that's like word for word verbatim quote exactly so yeah the the things that he owned end up owning him he can't move he can't do anything he's like he's just stuck in this terrible situation where he's a divorced dad trying to take care of his kids and his ex-wife hates him and you know he's got all these things but none of them can buy the love of his kids or his his wife so or his ex-wife so it, it's it's such a but sad it's... situation every time i talk to him it makes me like it just drives the point harder and harder home in my head that like things just do not buy happiness and, and they actually restrict right. you from finding your happiness, you know, finding your way in the world because you're tied down. Well, it's not just that he's attached to those things. It's he's literally like he's attached to his, his own idealized sense of self. So like he's got this part of him that he doesn't want to die, but he needs to let this part of him die. It's like cutting off a, a growth or a tumor so that you can like keep thriving as a person. He doesn't want to let this part of him die because in his own mind, it represents like hope because this was his, he thought, he thought maybe naively, we, who are we the fuck to judge? We've probably done similar mistakes. You know, he thought that this was the ultimate manifestation of wealth and wealth takes many forms, can take the form of money, can take the form of interpersonal connectivity or relationships even just take the form of like you're just happy to be a fucking live and your sense of wealth comes from your like day-to-day -day existence you know just your perpetual uh, experience is enough to be wealthy to you we derive our wealth in different ways and obviously he is trying to fill a hole from his childhood of not having that sense of financial stability and he feels like giving up those assets is akin to death and that's why he can't detach from it because as far as he's concerned like giving up that part of him is akin to killing him and in a way he's right in a way it is killing him but it's killing the part of him that needs to die for the new him to grow and that's the problem is that he doesn't realize that letting go of that cliff edge is exactly what he needs to do to kind of have like a mini death like a, a death before death so to speak of realization and like you know kind of ascending himself a little bit to to new possibilities rather than being trapped in that same framework right it, i mean it's confusing to me because letting go of all those things doesn't make him poor you know what i mean it would actually make him more rich <laughs> because he wouldn't yeah, have so many liabilities you know what i mean he wouldn't have yeah. the huge house he's got to pay mortgage or whatever that would like yeah it, he, he would actually become more rich and he is very rich but it's like He's asset rich though. He's, it's different. No, he's got a lot of money too. Like this is what I'm saying. It's like he's well. very rich, but he he okay. uh, um he would become more rich if he sold these things and and downsized and like accepted less, like having less things and just focus on their right, right. relationships. But right, right, right. he's like for the whole time I've known him and his kids, he's always been trying to set thing like set up nice things for them you know what i mean like uh, he doesn't it. want them to ex he doesn't want to repeat the cycle of trauma he doesn't right. want this kid to experience what he experienced right he's trying to um he's not trying to buy them but he's he's trying to give them nice experiences and he thinks that that will you know yeah. give them a nice childhood um, you he's know, like, having these great from Game of Thrones trying to break the wheel, but not necessarily seeing the the issue with what the like, you know what I mean? The, the means don't necessarily justify the ends in this case. And the same with like Khaleesi, like she might have had good intentions, but you know, as you've heard before, like you know, the road to hell is paid of good intentions. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Now things are a real mess for him. It's pretty sad. It's pretty sad to see. 
but um i mean that's that's something that i've i've watched throughout my entire like adult life because he's uh he's quite a bit older than me but um it's like uh it's something that i've learned to or i've learned from deeply you know what i mean in the deep sense i've really learned mm -hmm. the the pitfalls of attachment now here's a question for you since we were talking through the lens of like buddhism or zen buddhism a little bit um, do you feel like you yourself are a student in this world and that there are teachers out there or do you feel like the only the only thing you need is yourself do you feel like all the answers are within or like what what, what belief structure do you actually subscribe to in, in this framework um no i definitely believe that like the world is a teacher like everything is a teacher you know every you can learn okay. from every situation you can learn from uh all different people like everybody who's doing some shitty thing to you is teaching you a lesson you know what i mean like they're all um it, it's kind of like uh what what's the, the saying um if you can't be a, a good uh if you can't be like a good role model if you can't be a good example or yeah then you can always be you know a stern warning if you can't be a okay. good example you can always be a stern warning it's like all these people who are acting shitty to you at your job or who are, you know, doing these dumb things like saying mean things to you or, um, you know, tricking you or lying to you. Like they're teaching you the pitfalls of what they're doing, right? They're doing something bad so that you can learn from, you know, not to do those things. But, you know, the that has to you have to have that mentality otherwise you'll you'll end up copying your surroundings you know what i mean you can't you can't just start doing what they're doing in order you know to to be a level playing field you have to learn from their mistakes and recognize their mistakes well they i think that's another trap as well of like people fall into um emulation quite often because this is like inherent human desire to to fit in or you know, like monkey see monkey do almost like it's like you know you you, you see uh, an action in a tribe or and that may, kind of encourages you to act in a similar way to either gain the same fruits of uh, say uh, social acceptance or I mean that could be something else like maybe you, you you admire someone and think that they represent a more idealized uh form of being to you like maybe like they seem to have got it figured out financially or something and they seem to like have their finger on the pulse and it's like you want to emulate their subset of behaviors because you on a deeper level on a subconscious level think that by aligning yourself to the habits of that person that maybe you will somehow be able to foster similar successes elsewhere and it's like i think that's maybe part of the issue is that a lot of people are trying to emulate patterns of behavior because they think that that will lead to the same kind of like social standing or financial gain that that person that they're emulating has been able to ascertain on this however 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 bad or naive that may be <laughs> right on this uh this idea i i had a for an example i had a co-worker um, mm. I was working at a really, really toxic job um, a couple of years back, and uh, there was a lot of toxic people who worked there. It was not a good situation, and I was trying to be as uh, detached as possible to not like take it seriously, and it did end up affecting me in the end, but there was another guy who was there who um, was kind of the butt of a lot of jokes, and he was uh you know kind of being tormented in in the job not giving it back but he he did end up giving it back he ended up giving it to everybody you know what i mean like he kind of adopted right. the style you know he kind of like fell in uh to harassing other people because How did they react to him doing that well nobody liked nobody liked it nobody liked him and i heard that he tried to kill himself as well so like he he just he he fell into that trap the trap of emulation what, what do you mean the trap of emulation like he started he he got tormented and then he became a tormentor and then you know right but, yeah, that never but made him reason, feel better uh -huh. 
but the reason why that dynamic went the way it did was because he didn't establish that dynamic from the start, right? Like he first let them just rip into him without giving anything back, and then no, later, he was. Like, he was giving it back. Like he was, he was, right he was emulating. I, I have no idea right from the start, but when I was there, when I was working with him, he was, you know, calling I back, got the impression. being really rude to them, and then also, uh, you know, because they were being rude to him, and then. Um, you know, tormenting other people who are who are newer than himself. You know, well, uh, based on what you told me, I assume that there had to the be cycle. like had to be a kind of a grace period of like before he started to emulate them, though, right? Is what I mean. Well, it's not I like imagine. day one of working there he emulated it. I, I wasn't imagine. there. I wasn't there on day one when he was there. But right. Um, but I imagine if it did go something like that, where it was like the first few days or weeks or however long he was kind of like not really doing that so much, or at least not putting up much of a fight, it's probably that they they didn't like him and disrespected him, and they were doing it through the lens of, haha, fuck you, I'm going to put you down. And he started giving them shit back, but through the lens of like, I'm going to give you shit back just to banter, to like mm -hmm. put up a fight. But they weren't looking at it like that. They were looking at it through the same lens at which they were doing that behavior to him. So then it became when he was, you know, giving it back to them, it wasn't banter. It was like him being disrespectful because they were being disrespectful. And he didn't establish that boundary or dynamic with them from the start to make it more of a healthy banter and less of like a disrespectful thing. There's a lot of disrespectful bullshit going around that job, man. It was crazy. Kind of, kind of kept just um kept to myself and didn't engage even though there was a lot of shit talking just uh let it go i think that's well there's there's a big difference between healthy banter and people just like shit talking each other shitheads and like yeah. yeah trying to pull each other down only because mm -hmm. if it was if it was genuine banter then the intention wouldn't be to tear you down the intention would be the opposite the intention would be to toughen you up to not actually to be able to deal with that better from those kinds of actual people who will tear you down and treat you like shit. So right. the banter is supposed to prepare you for those toxic individuals that do just try and tear you down. So I feel like a lot of the, um, toxic, uh, you know, attacks and, and, and that type of thing, the toxicity is veiled in the, uh, this like a smoke screen of toughing toughening mm -hmm. you up you know what i mean it's veiled in the intention yeah. of toughening you up like they will say that that's what they're doing when they're really just trying to shit on you and t tear you down you know what i mean it's like th this this is this is a great excuse for yeah. like bullying and and acting a, like a complete ass um oh yeah, we're just trying to toughen you up like no that's <laughs> Usually you can figure that out pretty quick because if they're not able to take it when you dish it back to them, then you kind of know what's up. Like if, if they can say those things to you, but you can't say those things to them, then you mm. know they're full of shit. Simple as that. I've had right. that happen to me a lot of times but where I, I thought I wouldn't, someone was I wouldn't. with me and as soon as I shoot it back, they like act all emotional. It's like, well, hang on a minute. Why is it okay for you to do it? And then when I do it, you act all emotional. You know? mm. I just wouldn't engage personally. Yeah. In, sh in firing it back it's like um you're just uh telling them that it's okay you know what i mean like I, I don't i don't feel it's necessary at all you don't need to toughen me up i'm tough like relax we're all fine here sometimes mm -mm. yeah I, I think sometimes maybe you, you don't have to fire back at all but i also think that depending on the person the dynamic it can be healthy to engage in that a little bit at least to to humor them and to let them know that you don't take yourself too seriously sometimes it could be good to you know develop a sense of camaraderie or something mm. but again it depends on the person you're dealing with like if they're being genuine and they are coming at it with a with good faith so to speak then then you can do that with that person but it's, if anything i would argue that you should do it just to kind of figure out what kind of person you're dealing with so what happens when i shoot this shit back at this guy like is he like liking that i'm shooting the shit back at him or is he like kind of annoyed because you kind of want to get a read on people as well, and you can kind of get a read on people that way. So I, I, I kind of want to, I want, I want better the devil I know. You know, I mean, I want to know what I'm dealing with. The same way I'd rather someone be openly racist, because I want to see my racist out in the open. I don't want to not know that the guy next to me, who's like actually a really deep closeted racist, and I would never find out unless like I really did some digging. That worries me. But the racist that's out there shouting profanities on the street corner, I prefer that because at least I can fucking see him a mile away.
I would I would fire back. I would I would say that like if you if someone's hitting you with that banter that type of thing, and you just are nothing but kind to them, that re and you could see it, they reveal themselves very quickly. Do you know what I mean? Like they they out themselves incredibly fast to that type Maybe, of thing. Yeah. Like they just Again, they can't yeah. handle it. You know what I mean? If you aren't gonna engage with them. Like they, they like blow up, they lose their shit because they, yeah, those are, yeah. if those they're are the, like the narcissists that it, like need to feed off of the negative energy, like those are uh, if it's, easy to figure out too. If it's genuine banter and you don't engage, you're just totally nice to them. Then they're going to like match your energy. Do you know what I mean? They're like, Oh, okay. Well, you know, he's yeah. not into I, banter. Let's just, let's just go with the, with the friendly approach. You know what I mean? The, let's no, just exactly. match the energy but if they're if they just like hammer on you with banter um even if you're not engaging it's like okay you're just an asshole like we we it's very easy to understand whereas if you start engaging with them then it's like it yeah it gets it gets complicated and messy and like you know did i go too far did he go too far like that that type of thing where it's like oh yeah. you know Maybe he's just upset because I like really hit a nerve. Do you know what I mean? Whereas like my approach would clearly, you clearly can tell what type of person they are by just how they react. Like, uh, I think it's just better just to show people kindness, right. even if they're a complete asshole, just show them kindness and you, they reveal themselves to you very fast. Yeah, I mean, I, I do kind of agree with the sentiment of like killing them with kindness. I do, I do, I do subscribe to that a little bit. Um, I don't think it's always the case, though. I think there mm. are situations which are nuanced, and it's like almost you got to be careful with that actually, because if someone's acting in a very ob overt, um, disrespectful way to you, and you respond with kindness, you're also signaling weakness and it might not have the desired effect yes maybe you're looking good moralistically because you're not doing anything and this guy's just being a dickhead at the same time you're enabling that guy being a dickhead by like just taking it like that and also it's signaling to him that it's not only okay for him to do that but maybe he can ramp it up so i think it's like not really signaling what you want it to and yes sure you will figure out where you stand but i think it also perpetuates that kind of toxicity and they're gonna look for people specifically like you who like want to throw up that framework of like you can't get to me i'm just going to be nice but that might be a challenge to them and the, some of the more sophisticated dickheads are going to see that as like a nice challenge to like really ramp it up on you you know what i mean like, mm. I, I, think, I think that can also get yourself into some trouble that is uh that sounds very familiar yeah makes sense makes sense so i think that that did happen to me a little bit at that job as well is like the the people who just saw it as a challenge like wow this guy yeah. didn't react like he has no um he just didn't care you know what i mean or he didn't um and he didn't uh, push back as well and then they want to push there's harder that. yeah because you and then you don't know what their actual intention is because they might be trying to make you break the same way some funny guys might want to make like a royal guard smile like he knows that royal guard's job is to be stoic and not smile so it's like fun to make him smile so it might not be a bad intention thing of like they want to be dickheads to you. it might literally be like i want to see if i can make the guy smile they want to see if they can make you crack a little bit, not even with like a negative intention, just because it's like, yeah, like like a challenge thing. But it could also be a toxic challenge thing of I want to fucking break this guy. So that's the thing. Then you don't even know what angle that is. So you're still not really gaining good de data because you don't know if they're coming at it from like, a, oh, I want to make the royal guard smile. It's funny. Or if they're coming at it like, yeah, I want to fucking get this guy. You don't even know which one that is. So I think it's a little bit um, not ideal personally to operate that way from what I've gleaned. Well, let's let's just make it clear cuz I think that um there's like two different there's two different um uh situations that we're thinking of. There's one situation where you have to comp you have to uh engage with this person for a long period of time and then there's the right. the situation where you can just walk away from that person and never talk to them again if you want. I think that my yeah, my I, that you can't necessarily avoid. My idea of or my my um method what we're talking about of just like not engaging and just with kindness that reveals the assholes really really fast 
And in the situation where you can just walk away, I think that's optimal. If you're in a situation where you can't walk away, you're in a coworker situation where you literally, you cannot avoid them. You know, you can't, you have to be around them. Then maybe you do have to engage somewhat with the banter. You know what I mean? Because you have yeah. to survive that situation. You can't just let them to beat up on you. Right. And like, um, so right. killing them with kindness is not going to work, but like, you know, not all, not all situations are the same. It's, it really depends on how much time you have to spend with that person. You know what I mean? Or like if you're able yeah. to detach from them and like, just, just walk away from them, you know, and, and not, never speak to them again, then yeah. I, I mean, it's never great to be in a, like a situation where you have to talk to someone every day or you have to be around them every day and they're an asshole but maybe you do need banter in that <laughs> you have to have banter in that situation to um <clears throat> to to survive you know what i mean but yeah. for me i just i would just say like whatever it is that you're getting out of that situation um whether it's money or whatever else you're better off just moving somewhere moving somewhere else if you're in a situation where you have to banter in order to survive uh you know just being kind is not gonna you know is gonna get you more victimized and talked down to and treated badly just just fucking leave just fuck it who cares right. you know just just find somewhere else to work find somewhere else to be find somewhere else to live um it's anything is better than like being forced down to their level in order to to stay alive do you know what i mean to like yeah yeah I don't necessarily think people need to like suddenly like become banter experts and like day in day out like engage in like back and forth banter. But what I am kind of trying to get at is I feel like to be able to be this more chill self that you actually are and want to be, you have to have a little teeth along the way. It's like you have to have teeth so that you're allowed to be kind. You know what I mean? No, like, I know what you're talking about. Like I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's like you, you want you know, you want to be that warrior in the garden. You know exactly what I'm talking mm, about. Like yeah. you want to you want to show them. Hang on a minute. If I really want to, I could do something about it. But I want to be chill. And if you if you have that energy where it's like they kind of get the vibe of like, oh, if he wanted to, he could fucking do something about it. It's just he's choosing to be chill. Like then you're going to get a much different reaction out of people. But if they think like you're, if they, here's the thing: by projecting that like, oh yeah, I'm going to be like nice and chill no matter what, so I don't like you know I'm going to treat you with kindness kind of thing. They might misinterpret that as weakness and not realize that you're actually being stoic. You know what I mean? Mm. You might flag the wrong signals and they might see that as an invitation to, to be even more dickheads whereas if right. you kind of can switch the energy a little bit because sometimes you have teeth like sometimes you engage a little bit not a lot sometimes it could just be one quick witty comment back at them just one thing like mm -hmm. they say their usual they, they say their usual shit to you and you just snap off with one little thing and that's it that's all you do for the rest of the week doesn't matter you just show them a little bit of teeth, just a little bit of teeth. I don't like and that either. I feel like that's a that's a challenge. Duh. They just you just challenge them. Now they're gonna pop off at you even more. Yeah, it's it's. I I would say to anyone in a situation like just just fucking leave the situation, just leave the job, leave the. You, you can't always do that. That's no, not always an option. You can. <laughs> I, I, nothing, I, I, I agree. Nothing is permanent, you know. Yeah. Oh, you you need that job. You really need that job. Like we can always find another job. We can always find another situation. You know. You know what I mean. We can always get into a different situation. There's, and you know, if someone's really beating up on you and and like, you know, verbally abusing you and stuff, that like, there's no reason to ever stay in that situation. I think. Yeah, but like sometimes I agree there's there's lots of times where you can just switch job or whatever, but there are a few niche situations where maybe you can't avoid this. I mean, maybe some of our listeners are on the younger side, maybe they're in high school and or whatever, and they're, they're able mm -hmm. to get away from these boys in school or something. What you think the answer to the bullying is just to treat your bullies with kindness? I mean, no. In fact, some of the nastiest people the, in the world, the only language they understand is violence. I'm not saying that I condone violence, so I think you should should be violent but i'm saying if you give off the impression that you're not willing to escalate to violence you might find that that's all you're going to run into because 
like I found, it depends on the guy. So like, let's say if it's like some Russian or some Polish guy, it's probably the opposite is true. It's squaring up to him and, you know, getting in his face and showing that you're not afraid. That's probably more of a challenge to him and he's probably more likely to fight you. But say you're more of a Westerner, like say British or American or something, usually the, in the inverse is true and having that uh, willingness to engage and willingness to escalate because there's this like un this is like unsaid uh like rules of engagement between men especially which is like you know first of all there's talking and then that escalates to like you know shouting yelling or like you, even some banter kind of goes into that because you can say nasty things in the banter to kind of you know be nasty without actually being openly shouting at each other but then that escalates to pushing as in like physical touch but not actual hitting right so like like getting in your personal space like right up against you shoving into you either through their chest or actually pushing you with their arms and then that escalates to actual full-on physical violence so now if you're in a dynamic of a man and you're just talking to him and you're just being nice and he's escalating and he's like kind of being intimidating and he's escalating to the more yelling stage and you're still just being nice and chill maybe that's okay but if he starts to escalate a little bit more and he comes into your personal space within striking range of you and you're still just doing the whole like yeah it's, everything's cool everything's nice this is not good this is not healthy if but instead you do the opposite and you kind of like say well okay well you want to come into my personal space well okay push into me i'm push into you a little bit and you start to show him that you're willing to match that energy and you're also willing to escalate that energy and give off the impression that if things come to it, you're willing to escalate to the full-on violence. I am. I guarantee you, you'll see different dynamics of men, 100%. Well, you're talking about something completely different than what I was talking about. Like, we're, we're talking about, you know, offhand comments, shitty things that people say. Like actual yeah, threats still, of violence. Yeah, still, is it doesn't totally matter though. Different. It still engages. It still engages the amygdala of your brain in the exact same way. Like when you get into like verbal confrontations with people, it still it activates your fight and flight response in the exact same way. As far as your brain is concerned, there's a potential here for something physical to happen. All right. Well, I would. I would say to anyone who's out there who's um, listening to shit and thinking, "Well, I got to stand up to that bully," and you know, if, if they're gonna threaten me with violence, I gotta, you know ramp it up to uh show that i am capable of of fighting or of uh you know actual violence to make them back down i would say you'd never never should um go to that place if you're not trained like if you haven't done anything to prepare for that like so many people will will you know f brush their tail feathers and like you know get up in the other person's face and you know get into their personal space and they don't have a an actual clue what the hell they're doing they've got no idea what's going to happen if they actually get in a in a physical uh, a violent confrontation and it's really dangerous like any violent conversation confrontation you get in with someone could actually cause you to die like you could die that's why your free why your amygdala is freaking out that's why you're actually like panicking yeah. your heart is beating like a million uh beats a second is because you know you might be in your school you might be in your uh workspace or whatever but when fists start to fly like literally people can die it's not a joke um if you're every everyone should train martial arts everyone should learn how to defend themselves like i learned how to defend myself when i was uh you know very young i learned uh judo throughout middle school high school and like i have no concern about some you know co-worker uh, taking a swing at me because i know how to defend myself i know how to handle myself so that's why i feel totally fine with being friendly and nice when people are being assholes because even if they escalate to violence like i i don't have any concern about like okay we can we can go there if you want to go there we can go there it's not a big deal I don't feel like I have to show them that I'm capable of going there. I just know that I can do it. I'm confident. But just that's that's just that's so the ultimate clear, necessarily mean just so we're clear, I don't necessarily mean you have to like engage on the same level. For example, if someone's trying to come into your personal space a little bit, it could be simple as just putting one hand on your chin and the other hand on your elbow, like you're crossing your arms and you're like thinking deeply because then you've just given yourself like options of like actually like defending yourself if he does do something. And you're also giving the impression that you don't want him to come too close as well. 
you're not actually doing anything, but you've just put your arms in like a, a position to both defend yourself and strike him should it come to it, and also telegraphing that you don't want him to come into your personal space. That's not like trying to escalate things and like, you know, trying to cause a fight or anything. That's just literally defending yourself and like, you know, preparing for the absolute worst. I feel like literally what you were saying just moments ago was um, the opposite of what you just said, but okay. Okay, but it requires nuance though. So like, I can only speak from personal experience, but I can tell you from my personal experience in every physical altercation I've been in, if I was the, per the, the times that I were trying not to fight, as in my mindset was like, I'm going to do everything in my power not to have a fight here, even so much as like turning and walking away. I've been struck almost every single time. Sucker punched. I've been like punched in the back of the head, all kinds of crazy shit when I've tried to not get into anything. And almost all of the times, almost all of the times where I did the opposite and I stayed front facing to the threat, shoulders back and engaging on whatever level I needed to. And sometimes that was having two guys in my face. And all I was doing was having one hand on one, the back of my hand on his chest, just controlling the distance. And every time he came in to like, get into my face with his fist balled up i just gently pushed him back a little bit and just controlled the distance while i was looking at the second guy because he had his hand in his pocket i just want to make sure he's not pulling out a blade or something right you, I'm, not, I'm not being aggressive i'm not even baring my teeth or anything i'm literally just standing there controlling the distance and just looking at them you don't have to be a to be aggressive and violent to respond to violence I just don't see how that's solving anything. What are you just going to stand there and and then they just keep escalating or what what are you, I mean, what are you, you doing? I mean, you could you could you could turn around and let him stab you in the back. That's also possible, right? I'd rather keep my eyes on the guy with the hand in his pocket and make sure nothing comes out of it. All right, this this is this is totally different from my experience, but this is nothing to do with like uh <laughs> well, the original conversation was about um people like bullying you in a vocal a verbal way right like if they're there's right. there's a lot of nuance to obviously um full on physical violence uh that we're, so we weren't is, really uh, talking about but even <laughs> but even in even in my example there wasn't yet any physical violence it mm. was just the it was at the push stage but here's the thing it was in the push stage of like entering my personal space with the the threat of physical violence because most people especially like some fucking plastic gangster on the street really they're looking for any reason to be aggressive and if you show them any kind of like weakness they see that as an, an opportunity to take even more advantage of you that might just be stealing your phone or whatever they will literally size you up in the street and see is this the kind of motherfucker that i can get and they might even test you. They might say, here's the thing, they might test you and say something to you and see if you're the kind of person, based on how you react to what they say, are you an actual like good target? And they'll they'll vet you out. They'll, they'll get a vibe for you. And if they feel like they can get you, then, then they're going to push you. Then they're going to try and get your stuff after they figured you out. So sometimes projecting that energy out there of like, I'm happy about everything, that can get you into trouble. It's not so much that it's it's... It's bad. I think it's great that people want to be like nice and kind to everyone. I'm just saying, like the reality of the world is like other people don't look at the world through that same language. Yeah, I don't think that you should be kind to someone who's threatening you. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you don't well, engage. Yeah. You don't engage with the back and forth of like they're shitting on you. You're gonna shit on them, and like uh, you know talking shit about people, um, you know, talking behind people's backs, uh, you know, engaging in that kind of like tit for tat, like, uh, shit talk that is not, you know, it's not helpful for anybody. You just ignore it, be kind, you know, like don't, don't allow it to get to you. But, um, you know, someone's gonna try to rob you like you're 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 kind of talking about here yeah like it happens in you phases, have to though. They, don't just, they don't just try and rob you right they 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 first vet you they're first going to figure out is this the kind of guy i can rob okay so, so if you're the means of if like you're a confrontation or something okay so if you're walking down the street um staring at the ground you know not paying attention to your surroundings that's more the the most likely person who's going to get robbed right like that that's that's yeah, the thing that's inviting that's someone to rob you especially they got headphones on you don't the 
the the thing that's gonna protect you from being robbed is not banter back and forth with the with the fucking you know psychopathic it's robber. It's just looking at them in the eye, seeing their face, like scanning them, and like, okay, I have a description of you. You know, you're walking down the street, you see somebody who looks kind of scary. You just look at them, you know, and like check them out, long? and then you know move on. If they if they How say something. Oh, for fuck's sake, man. Come on. What are we... What are we... <laughs> well, if I say five seconds, are you going to say three seconds? Like, what What are we What are we doing? You look at them. You look at them. I generally got something to, I, I would say no, about you, this particular you, instance. You look at them long enough to see, you know, their, their description. You know, if they try to rob you, then yeah, maybe they get your phone. But then you go to the police, you tell them exactly what they look like. You know what I mean? It this is this is a lot of this is why to, people to this is why people rob this is this is when people rob people is when they ex, when they think that there's a reasonable chance that they can get away with it. That's what they're that's what they're looking at whenever they're kind of, they're yeah. trying to rob someone. Like if they if they think that they can, you know, sucker punch you in the back of the head, you're not even paying attention and steal your shit or, you know, yeah. They then they, then they're more likely to do it. But if if they're if you're somebody who's walking straight up right and you're looking at people in the face, you know, you, you see you saw their face, you saw what they look like, then they're much mm. less likely to to rob you. There's there's, there's this is yes, clear. yes and no. So there's nuance to this. So uh, the the universal rule that I would say is you look at them for like literally a split second, then you look back ahead um as like uh I've assessed you and don't deem you a threat, but I've assessed you kind of thing. But the reality is, is like, depending on where you are in the world depends on how you should act. So like, if I'm on, if I'm in the streets of London and fucking Croydon or something, and I look at a motherfucker across the street, oh boy, am I more likely to get robbed now? Just by looking at him, I'm more likely to get robbed. That's like, just by looking at him is a challenge. Because if I'm a civilian, if I'm a civilian and he's active, then I've just, I've just opened myself up to be a target just by looking at him, just by looking at him. Just if, if I even remotely catch his gaze for a split second, I'm fucked. That's going to be like, yo, what are you looking at fam? Instantly, instantly, instantly. So it depends on where you are in the world as well. And I think this is the problem is that there is no like cookie cutter way of dealing with people. People are very nuanced and depending on what culture you've got, your background or your ethnicity, all kinds of crazy shit is going to like dictate how you should and shouldn't interact with that person. And there's no right or wrong answer. The reality is, is that you're going to fuck up. You're going to piss people off and get yourself into all kinds of crazy shit. But you can be a bit astute and kind of size up where you are in the world, what kind of what the vibe is and what you should and shouldn't do. And that will help you out a little bit. You know, it's like learning about a culture before you visit it to like learn what's like considered culturally acceptable over there or not. Well, what I would say is the best policy is, like you said, be a, like a warrior in a garden and be, uh, you know, more capable than you let on like Sun Tzu, basically, you appear to be weak when you're actually strong, right? People who appear to be strong are actually weak for the most part. The people who are walking around and, you know, acting tough, and when people try to confront them, they're, like, firing back and being all tough. This is this is a sign of weakness. If you are yeah, the person okay. who is, you know, you're very kind, you're very uh, soft-spoken, and when the shit hits the fan like you are capable that is the best way to be you know if you're not if you're if you're not willing to be capable then i guess you can follow you know that ideal of just like you know learning how to banter to to stay alive in the streets if if someone is yelling you know you know what you're looking at fam and you gotta hit them back with something that's witty so that they won't you know attack you or whatever you know what what mm -hmm. are you gonna say to them when they say that if you're if you're actually you know not capable of handling yourself um yeah i mean that's fucking true right if you, so, and, and and the most extreme example of that is prison so in prison it's like people are just like they want the excuse to fight so mm -hmm. when they say to you what are you looking at and your answer is nothing you call me nothing bang and it starts there is no right answer you know what i mean mm -hmm. so yeah this is the problem is like yeah, I agree with you on a deeper level of like, you don't want to engage with, with that. 
but it's it's knowing how to engage that's important i don't think there's like a one size fits all of like you just like kill them with kindness there's going to be a lot of situations where you kill them with neutrality or you know you just like you know you maintain your surroundings but you don't necessarily respond verbally there are those times where that's good there's times where being stoic and not even saying a single word and just carrying yourself well that that's enough sometimes mm -hmm. there'll be times where that's not the case there'll be times where someone wants a reaction out of you because if they don't get one they might think that you are weak they might think that you you haven't got something to say that they're, they're trying to like force you to say something of your chest to see what's going on inside of you because if you're able to walk around all confident cool but if they challenge you and you're still just like not saying anything they might be like hang on a minute is this guy actually confident or is he like scared to say something so you want to be you sometimes not always it can be good to kind of give them the impression that you're a real one in the sense of mm -hmm. it's called okay. a, a g check you know what i mean do you know, do you know what I mean by g check no but i think i know what you're okay, talking so, about right so like say if i like, again if i was on the streets of london and i was sat at a bus stop and some guy come up and was like wow well, one fam and if i look if i look at him i'm like uh uh i'm okay how are you if i do that he's gonna he's gonna know what i'm all about but if i like engage with him on his level and i'm like I'm like yeah what's up if I just have that same kind of energy, my engage with him, then like I'm passing the G check because like he's seeing, am I comfortable in his world? Hmm. He can gauge that from my response and I'm making him comfortable by also showing him that I can interact with him on their level. Whereas if I do act more stoic and reserved, that might make him uncomfortable. He might be like, yo, is this guy a fucking fed or what? I don't know why if you thought you were a fed that would be bad you're just at a bus stop but um doesn't matter I mean, maybe <laughs> he's involved in some shit and he he's paranoid and he might be thinking like yo is this guy a fed like, that, that's all that matters well, you're, he, not, he's a... you're not trying to like buy drugs from him or something right like you just, you just... He, he, maybe but maybe but maybe he's, he deals drugs he's maybe down he the... deals drugs and he thinks that you're onto him or something okay well that's a yeah, that's possible. quite the situation <clears throat> But I would say, or like, might just not let, like feds. He might just not like feds. Let's let's just talk about like um, what you were talking about earlier with um, like the 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 slow escalation between men when there's like the the pushing, the 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 yelling at each other, that sort of phase. Um, I I I found from my experience the best way to like de-escalate the situation is to like skip phases you know what i mean so like whenever i've been in a a situation in high school where there was like that um <clears throat> where there was you know people they're they're saying something rude to you and then they start yelling at you and mm. before they even get to the pushing phase i just get ready to fight do you know what I mean? Like I just take a a fighting stance and I go, okay, let's go. Let's fight. And um they're not ready. You know, they 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 still got a few steps left. You know, they want to push you, they want to get around, you know, they want to um uh you know, go through those moves, maybe getting close enough to like sucker punch you or something like that, you yeah. know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. you know, once we're at the 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 yelling stage, it's like, okay, um this i know where this is going this is going to be this is going to become a fight so like well, you want to fight let's do it and then at that point usually they're they're not ready to get to that stage yet they're and they're kind of put off by your willingness to that's go to that fight that's kind of my original point and that's then like kind of okay, what I was getting they're, yeah. they're going to they're going to be like they're they're going to step down pretty quickly but this yeah. this is you have to know how to fight like you have to be confident that you can kick yeah. their ass. Like there's no, you, you can't do, know. you can't do this if you are, you know, weak, you've never been in a fight. You don't know how to fight. Like this is not, this is not yeah, how, I, yeah, you but can't to do be this. Fair to you, I've, I've, again, I can only speak from personal experience. Your experience may vary, but I, I I've I've won fights in the sense of de-escalated a fight from allowing myself to be hit as well. I've I've had situations where, like, there was an altercation where, say, a guy was having an argument with my friend, and they were both shouting at each other. And I walked up, and all I did 
was I like I just looked looked at him and like he kind of like said something to me pointing his finger at my face and all I did was like kind of like furrow my brow a little bit and that was enough for him to like square up to me and just full on like slap me as hard as he could in my ear like not not my face my ear like trying to like you know knock knock me spinning by slapping me in the side of the ear and I, I literally just took took it without any reaction and then just got in myself into a fighting stance and he went to cock up another slap to the side of my head and all i did was just kept squared up to him ready to fight and he went to throw it stopped didn't throw it went back relaxed i relaxed and then i offered him a chewing gum and then he was chill <laughs> okay <laughs> and i i didn't even need to fight i literally just showed him i was willing to fight i ate the first one i was willing to take a second one and then go right. just by showing him that willingness like you say and mm -hmm. I don't think you need to learn how to fight. I think you need to learn how to be hit and not be scared of being hit because the biggest issue with fighting is the fear of being hit and everyone's got a fucking plan until they get hit in the face, like Mike Tyson says. So yeah, you can be a trained fighter and stuff. Yeah, fighting's dangerous. You don't want to fight. You should do everything in your power to avoid fighting. But sometimes the only way to avoid fighting is showing a willingness to fight. Mm -hmm. and that's the, the kind of thing we're trying to get at here. Right. I mean, you did get in the fight. You got hit. So, I mean, yeah, but I wasn't scared of being hit, and that stopped the fight. Mm. If, if if I show if I, if I if I flinched or went Ugh, when he hit me or something, maybe he's gonna be like, oh this fucking pussy and start bitch slapping me up mm. because I just ate it, didn't even react to it, and just got into fighting stance like let's go. He was like immediately like oh, okay, maybe I don't want this. So is this, is this the advice you would give to people? They need to just what, like, get smacked in the face and not react. No, I'm saying like if it come <laughs> if it comes to a situation where someone's gonna like physically like assault you, if they if they punch you in the face, I would say immediately flee the situation or immediately punch them back. But in a situation where it's kind of like a half and half, where maybe it's a misunderstanding and they thought that you were squaring up to them to fight and they they went to like bitch slap you or something. Yeah, I would say I'm just gonna eat that shit. Show them that I don't get, I don't care, and that I'm willing to escalate. Because to me, like the bitch slap isn't that big a deal. Like getting slapped in the side of the head. I mean, sure, it maybe hurts a little bit, but not really. I mean, it's nothing like getting punched in the face. Hmm. Seriously. Sure. And I don't want to hurt anyone. Like I don't, I don't. I've, I've had fights where I didn't even hit them. It literally was just me tackling them to the ground and saying the words i don't want to hurt you because i don't want to have to do anything too significant to stop the fight i don't want to have to punch someone in the face to stop a fight that's going to be my last resort even when it does get physical All right no i haven't really punched anybody in the face either not much just uh just taking them to the ground is pretty it's more than enough that's all you, that's all you need usually you don't have to to physically punch someone in the face just just you know take take them out in the sense of like you know go low get your arms around their waist maybe like put your leg behind their leg and like you know try and sweep up their leg a little bit to give you a bit of leverage and take them to the ground pin them down and just yeah try and subdue them that way well i don't know how we yes, got, you should probably have got some judo this. trainer or something but mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah uh, n none of my arguments are um, uh, like uh, people berating me at work ever got to physical violence and I didn't think that it ever would because you'd just get fired immediately. Like when there's no there's no threat of physical violence because you know the person would just literally be thrown out. <clears throat> they would lose their job. Mm. Um, well, that's why it's important to have the verbal teeth because they know that there's if you don't escalate verbally, then they, they got like a, a get out of jail free card because they know it's not going to go physical. And if you've not got the teeth to be verbal, well, then they've just got free reign over you. No, I think opposite. Like there, if you, if you go verbal, there's no, there's no limit to how far you can go because there's no like threat of violence. So you can just keep going and going and going. And if you keep going back and forth at each other, like there's, there's literally no, there's no end to it. Do you know what I mean? It just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse. I think the opposite could be true. I think that if you don't 
give them a little bit of teeth, they might go worse and worse and worse and worse because you're not giving anything back. I, I think that people, that, that doesn't really make sense. Everyone, like, if you just keep getting worse and worse on one person in a social setting, like, nobody... That's what happens, though. Like, what do you think everybody else is going to think? That you're just you're just hammering away at this person, you know? Are you really, like... Are you willing to be like the the have the image of just being a complete asshole? You know what I mean. If that's fine with you, then I guess then. But it usually doesn't happen in isolation. Usually, those people are like giving everyone shit and blah blah blah. But that's just the thing. Is like the other people that are giving them shit back don't get it as bad. And the, the fish that's easiest to get picked on usually gets it the worst. It's like being in a poker game. Like if you're the weakest player at the table, well, guess who everyone's gonna be eyeing up like a shark. And I think if you. If you're engaging and like going back and forth with the person, then everyone at the table is thinking like, "Oh, this is this is something that they want. This is something that they ask for." You know what I mean? Like they're 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 a participant, you know. Whereas if no, you're I mean, not the inverse is true. If if, if you're going to call their bluffs more, then they're going to be less likely to bluff you. No, no, I'm saying like in the eyes of everybody else who's not part of the dynamic of you and that other person is going to see you as not a, like, that you're not being, like, uh, attacked. You're just, you're part of the back and forth, you know what I mean? And whereas yeah, but... if you're if you're not engaging, then it's just like, that person is just a pure asshole, just shitting no, on I, you. I get what you mean, I get you what you mean? mean, and yeah, like, that, that can help a lot. That can help a lot when you, like, right. especially if it's, like, less, the, the fewer people are involved, the better. So if it's, like, a, a three-way dynamic where it's just one other person witnessing this one person treat you in this way and you're not reacting or doing anything to instigate it, then, yeah, of course. But usually these things don't happen in, in, in such linear ways. And there's lots of times where it goes on behind closed doors or something where it's just, like, more or less just you and this other person are able to see this interaction. Mm hmm and also, like, I don't think you should concern yourself too much with the opinions of other people. I think that in itself is a trap. Well, I mean, right. But if you're in a work environment, the concerns of other people, for instance, your boss, someone who controls the That's fate of job, you yeah. and your job, and their, the other person's job, you kind of need again, to pay attention to their... But only their, as it relates uh, to your job. Their understanding the of the situation, dynamics. right? Their understanding of the situation is important. Yeah, as it relates to your job. Mm -hmm. I know I know what you're saying. You're saying in the sense of like your boss sees you you two having this altercation if you're giving it back, then it seems like you're part of the problem or whatever. And it's like not a one way dynamic or whatever. I get that, but the reality is, is that the manager doesn't give a shit. They're, these people aren't even paid enough to care enough. Like the only thing they care about is productivity, or at least the the illusion of productivity, not even actual productivity. There's plenty of uh, workplace environments where they've got, say, like regular meetings, and these meetings are even detrimental to productivity because they disrupt workflow and the people that need to focus on their shit and if they have to get up and go do a stand-up meeting for 10 minutes uh, they've completely fucked up their workflow and that's going to take them a whole, a whole hour or two just to get back into the flow state and get back to being productive again or whatever the case may be and but as far as the management's concerned it's like productive we need everyone full attendance at the meeting please rather than just having like one motherfucker there to get the notes and email everyone the notes of the meeting and actually be a bit more productive uh, people only care about the optics of these things not the actual productivity of, of the reality of it so uh, again I, I wouldn't concern myself with the opinions so much because these people don't even know what they're talking about and they don't even have the first clue about like what is productive to a work environment or what have you well if you don't care about what the opinions of others are then why would you care about what other people say to you about you like why would you even engage with the person who's uh, shitting on well, you, you can, if you're you can, if you don't care you, you just don't care you don't care you about care what and people say it, which, if anything that's the best way because then you're not being emotionally reactive to what they're saying and that's the best way to banter but that is that is your emotional reaction is they said something shitty about you and now you have to banter back to them something else right like it doesn't have to come from a place of emotion though i don't i don't see how that's possible if you're coming like 
if you're if really you're attached, detached just, because if you're not because if yeah that's the thing though if you're not attached to it on an emotional level then how do you have an emotional reaction to it what if you're not attached to the opinions of that person how could you have an emotional reaction to it right so then you don't have an emotional reaction to it. you don't you don't so then say you anything choose to it about so it you, so when you so when you engage with them you're not you don't react, engage then you're, if you don't engage, then you don't have an. Okay, if, but let's say. How, how can you engage with them if you don't have any emotional reaction to what they said? You don't need to have any emotion. There's people out there that are like literal psychopaths that are devoid of like any kind of like emotional. Oh, they have emotion. Like they, they don't have the emotions have, that we they, recognize, they but they have. They have range of emotions. Though, yeah, right? they have they're anger. Right? They have frustration, right? That's about it. Yeah. That's it, right? So everything is through that. That's what we're trying to avoid is those type of emotional reactions. So like where where is it coming from when someone says something really shitty about you to your you know, in front of a bunch of people and then you turn around and and bash back at them. Like that's coming from a place of, of anger and frustration. Like how can you say that that is just like, oh, I'm just I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. So I'm just gonna shit on them back. <clears throat> you know what I mean? I guess it depends on how you're shitting on them as well. Like if you if you like yeah if you if you seem emotionally charged when you're doing it as well. If and you you're seem like really emotionally them, charged, why do you care about what other people think yeah. about you? What it, that they seem how people, you seem. I'm saying if other if other people <laughs> seem that right. Right. Yeah. So why other do you why do you care about you what uh, what other people's vibe what other people what other people get the vibe from you that you feel you seem emotionally charged. I don't. I'm speaking I'm speaking from your what you're proposing. I'm speaking from that lens. Yeah, I know, I, I know. <laughs> but like you're not under you're not um like the you're not recognizing that literally when you bash back at somebody it's coming from emotion it's coming from negative emotion, right? Like whatever they said to you affected you. So now you're you're hitting back at them. I I completely disagree. Like, what are you talking there's about? Times, there's times where that is that is true, and I think for most people that probably is true. If it doesn't affect you, time, you feel no need to bash back at them. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I feel no need to do a lot of things, and I still engage with doing stuff. Like, Why? You know, voluntarily. Well, I don't I don't feel the need to take pictures of the sky. I just like to sometimes. Sometimes it's just fun. So you're just doing it for fun. Well, maybe because, like, who knows? Maybe this is the only way that that person can connect with people. Maybe their entire life, like, their their love language is banter. You know? Did you consider that possibility? Well, I don't. Uh, I don't feel like I need to connect with somebody who only likes to shit on somebody, shit on other people as their love, their love language, as you say. But maybe, no, but maybe that no guy necessary, is, unnecessary. But maybe, but maybe all that them. guy is trying to achieve is just to see that you don't take yourself too seriously. What well, if that's it? What if once you show him that you you don't take life too seriously? Okay, I don't need to. Serious, I don't need to shit on him. Him. I don't need to shit. I don't need to bounce back at him to show but that I'm the, that I'm not taking but, myself too seriously. That's that's giving the all, but, opposite but effect. Thing. Maybe, maybe, maybe but, but but what if you shit on him or not shit on him? But maybe if you retort in such a way that shows that you don't have a huge emotional reaction to it. Because here's the thing, if you do have a big emotional reaction to it, it might be hard for you to, to think of a little witty retort and like actually shoot back at him because you might be so like hung up on what he said about you, right? Is kind of the point. So it's kind of easy for people to get an emotional read on you when you shoot back. Like, is this, is this coming from a place of emotion? Like, is he just like shooting shit at me to shoot shit at me? Or is he just saying something funny? Here's the thing. What's his intention? Is his intention to shit on me or his intention to be funny? It's really important. If his intention is to be funny, then that's completely different, right? So basically, people shit on you. You just try to be funny about it. No, I'm saying you can you can come at it through the lens of trying to be funny and see if they are still sort of doing that. So if 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 you if you if you do that, if they say say they say to me like, "Ah, oh, Jean, you really fucking you really fucking talk a lot of shit sometimes," and I kind of go, <laughs> "Yeah, I do, right? Yeah," and and you also kind of do this, don't you? And you kind of do it through that sort of angle. Like they might realize, "Oh, hang on a minute." One, he doesn't actually like take himself so seriously, and he's like able to like 
run run with what we say about him and realize that yeah he knows that he's human and fallible and he doesn't take himself too seriously and he's also willing to shoot shit back at us and show that he's not like getting super butthurt at the same time i feel like that's more powerful than, than just like being stoic and not engaging because i feel like you'll miss out on a lot of potential connections that way i'm not talking about they're just you know laughingly back and forth i'm talking about like people being actually mean to you like Someone saying, like, what are you, a fucking idiot? Well, that's not... That's a bit different. This is what I'm talking about. Is like, people actually, like, shitting on you. Not, not you know, making a joking, like, haha, that's funny. Like, they're actually, like, right on crapping on you. Do you know what I'm talking about? You're not going to make a joke out of that. And, like, have it be funny. Oh. You know what I'm saying? Well, the, but this is the thing is that you have to like be more specific about the context because originally <laughs> you were talking about it from like a lens of like, you know, shitting oh, on you. Yeah, but, yeah, like, shitting on you. Lens. Like I was talking about a, a co-worker of mine who he was getting shit on a lot at work. People were crapping on him and treating him badly. And then he, you know, started like shitting on them and, and you know, throwing it back at them. And then he ended up becoming the person who was like the worst at shitting on all the new people. You know, anyone who came into the to the company, he would be really shitty and annoying to them, and like uh, you know, super negative, um, kind of right. like tearing everybody else down. You know, and then he tried to kill himself because he was in such a bad situation. You know, he be he became part of the the crew of people who are really, really shitty. And that well, made him I, completely depressed and, you know, Well, I maybe self misinterpreted what you mean by shitting on, because I, 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 I was talking about the banter stuff and you were kind of running with what I was saying. So I assumed that you were also meaning it in like a banter sense, not like literally, oh, you're a, you're a, you're a complete dumbass kind of like attitude of like not even trying to make it into a joke or banter or anything. All right. Well, I'm talking about a toxic workplace. Shouldn't this is a, a place that I ended up having to to bail out of? It's so so horrible, you know. Like I'm not talking about like oh they're just joking around, you know, having a good time. They're fucking hating on each other, you know, shitting on each other. Really, uh, you but know. This... <laughs> yeah, but I guess I would actually need to see the dynamic to to, to fully understand what you're saying. Because so what I'm saying different... is when people are shitting on you, you don't engage. You, there's no reason to engage with people who are shitting on you and like throw shit back at them because I, I mean if it's a funny thing if you're just hanging out and uh you know you're all friends and you're bantering yeah that's fine I'm just saying if there's people who are treating you badly like really badly there's no reason to to try and throw it back because it you're, you're perpetuating you're like you're creating it in your own life like you're you're putting it you're putting out the same energy. It's uh, right, it's really bad. It's it's not good. You gotta. My original. My... Uh -huh. Go ahead. My original. My original point was just that you shouldn't show that kindness to that. Is that if someone is genuinely shitting on you, you shouldn't treat their disrespect by being kind to them. And I get what you're saying about like the optics of the outlooker looking in, but that's just weakness to 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 let someone walk all over you and actually genuinely disrespect you and like show them kindness back is only a weakness and that's that's what the image you'll be projecting out into the world on at least a subconscious level no so i, I, think, agree I with think you're wrong i think you're wrong i think that showing kindness to the people who are the worst in the world is like the most real strength that there is man that's that's strength emotional strength like you're you're satisfied with yourself. You know that you're you're living correctly in accordance with nature. You are, uh, you know, a strong human being emotionally. And you, you know, if there's if they're gonna go to physical violence with you, yeah, you're you're ready to take that on. But like, there's there's sure. nothing that these people can say that's gonna actually tear you apart. You know what I mean? Like, literally, you you look, Shin. If you say something to me right now, there's literally nothing you can do. Or you, there's nothing you could say that will ruin my life. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's nothing that's gonna yeah. that's gonna t actually tear me down because I'm no, fine. I like, not. 
if you said something really fucking horrible to me, then I would just not return it and I would just disconnect from you. You know what I mean? I would just Maybe, say, okay, I think I could we're, make you we're angry done. before you, know you disconnect. Them, okay. Right? Yeah. You make me angry, but I'm not going to retort to you. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm not going to turn around and give you back the same energy because I'm not going to go to you, to that level. You know what I'm saying? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying now? I'm, there's there's no reason for me to go down to that level because there's nothing you can say to me that's going to... And, and even if I'm a victim, okay, if I'm... Even if I am... I, if everybody in the podcast or everybody in the world thinks that I'm weak because I didn't respond to the shitty thing that you said, I'm still... In my mind, I am still the... Uh, you know... I'm doing the right thing. I didn't say the bad thing. Like I didn't. I I could have said whatever came to my mind, but that's not the right thing to do. I did the right thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, but who who gets to decide what the right thing is? Well, the right thing is. Exactly. I mean, if you are shitting on people, are you really doing the right thing? I think everybody knows what the right thing is deep down. It's not. It's what not. All right. Yeah. It's not. Uh, like you don't need to go to God or to go to fucking the Bible to figure out what the right thing is. Like you just people intrinsically know that it's not right to shit on people. It's not right to steal. Like it's not right to to you I know. I don't know that they do. Okay, well I don't know that people do intrinsically know these <laughs> things. All right, sure. Not being serious. I think that's why a lot of people do end up turning to organized religion is because it's harder for them to get a moral compass going maybe it's because of their upbringing you know maybe that's all they know if they grew up in a toxic environment with their their parents and shit and all they know is violence and aggression and stealing and manipulation that's their world i mean how could they know anything else i would still argue that they that they know what's right and wrong it's not um it's not rocket what's science that? Well, well, okay, well, who gets to decide what's right and wrong? And someone else's right and wrong might it's, differ from it's yours. Literally, no. It's literally just, would you want that thing to be done to yourself? You have to think of yourself like, okay, you, you know, you have to think of other people, people like they are yourself. If you were that like, person, would you want them to do that to you? you would you want but, them to steal your thing? No? Then it's fucking wrong. That's pretty obvious, but what dude. If, but what if you've had your shit stolen your entire life? And like, okay, so you, you then know, you know that you know, know it even yeah. more. You know it even deeply, more deeply well, that you hate your stuff being stolen. So you wouldn't like that to happen to to you. Shouldn't this that, is that not happens. rocket science, man? Hang on, relax, relax. Okay, okay. It happens sometimes. It happens sometimes where this is this two things that can happen. Like say there's abuse in uh say there's like child abuse or something, and like. The kid will grow up and you'll either two things will happen. Either they will perpetuate that cycle of abuse uh -huh. and continue. And cycle, you don't think or that, they will, Okay, okay. But or, let's say they, per, they will, perpetu or, perpetuate that abuse. Do you think that they really don't think that that's wrong? It's not about what what who they what they think is right. Yeah, this is what we were talking even, about. This is what we were talking about. Is do they, they think, think it, do they know that it's right if, or wrong? Even if they even if they think it's right or wrong, it's irrelevant because it doesn't mean they will act. There's people out there. <laughs> How can you say, say it's irrelevant what, now? <laughs> we just the whole relax. the whole I'm, I'm argument that we're just speak. having I'm is do they know that it's right or wrong? And you're saying now it's irrelevant. <laughs> I'm saying it's irrelevant because there's people out there that are say like you know Christians and they know that they allegedly know what's right and wrong. Do they actually act in accordance with that? Absolutely not. Just because you have some kind of sense of what's right and wrong doesn't mean like they live their lives to that. Okay, you know but what, I mean? what you're saying is irrelevant because they do know that it's right or wrong. Is you just admitted that they know it's right or wrong? <laughs> like, no, I'm uh, saying in, in, even in examples where they do know that it's right or wrong, it can still be irrelevant because it doesn't actually change their actions. They can still do the wrong thing despite knowing that it's yes, right or wrong. Doesn't yes, really change anything. Yes, they can do the wrong thing when they know it's wrong. I'm not arguing with you on that. You're changing the goalposts, man. I told you that. People know what's right or wrong, and you said no, and then you changed the goalposts. Both cases. No, no, no. I'm saying even in. I'm saying no. They don't always know what's right and wrong because they haven't always had the opportunity to learn what's right and wrong. And I'm saying even in the instances where they do, doesn't necessarily mean they will act in accordance to that. 
they know what's right and wrong, but they also don't know what's right and wrong. And even if they do know what's right and wrong, it doesn't matter. Right, like, <laughs> right and wrong can differ based on cultures. Like one culture might think something is right and another culture might think that's a hideous thing to do. Like who's the arbiter of who's right and wrong? Who decides that? The... What I'm saying, man, is that all you would, all you need to do is think of other people like they're yourself. If you were going to do that to them, would that would they be upset? Would they hate that thing that you're about to do? That's how you know what's right um, and wrong. Right. I don't, I, okay, I disagree with that because in the example of someone that's like been subject to a lot of abuse and maybe they're like cold to that abuse, so like they wouldn't necessarily mind someone doing something toxic to them because it's kind of par for the course. They might perpetuate those same behaviors and project them out into the world because it doesn't really affect them that much because they're happy for it to be done to them. What about that? They're happy to be abused, so they, they abuse other people because they think that it's right. I still think that they think that it's wrong. They, they know that it's wrong, but they're doing it anyway. How do they know that it's wrong? If that's all they've known. They know it's wrong because they know that they've been fucked up. That's fucked them not, up. Not everyone, not everyone knows that they're fucked up. There's a lot of people that are fucked up, of course, but there's a lot of people that don't know that they're fucked up. Well, you can tell because they usually hide those things. You know, if they're going to do that shit, they hide it <clears throat> because they know that it's fucked up. If they're not, if they no. don't know that it's fucked up, then they wouldn't hide it. Yeah, but circling back to our previous conversation, mm -hmm. like people can literally lie to themselves and have like a warped sense of reality. They can do these fucked up things through the lens of not doing a fucked up thing is my entire point. So what a covert narcissist is all about. They can do these fucked up things through the lens of not doing fucked up things that it's not yeah, fucked so like up. A covert, so a covert narcissist cares about like maintaining like the optics of like being a good guy or whatever, right? So like on the surface he looks cool and shit, but behind closed doors he could be super nasty to the people that he's closest to. But the reason is not flexible true, enough less... for these mental gymnastics, man. I'm not flexible enough. Hmm. I'm not flexible enough for these mental gymnastics, bro. This is too much. Where are we going? Mental the mental gymnastics of explaining why people don't know what they're doing is wrong. Like, they know what they're doing is wrong. They're hiding it. No, there's they're... people with literally like cluster to be personality type disorders, which are literally mentally unwell, that don't know what they're doing is wrong. Okay, well, I mean, some people are like little robots. They're a psychopath they don't know what they're doing is wrong but they're hiding it they know what's wrong even if they're a they psychopath even if they're a complete psychopath and they don't feel like they don't empathy. they don't because just because somebody doesn't have empathy for somebody else like they they literally just can't feel for somebody else they still know it's wrong because the the society has taught them that it's wrong they're hiding what they're doing you know what i mean if they're just completely out in the open, they have no idea that it's right, what's right and wrong. They're just doing everything in the open. Then maybe I can understand that point. But like, this is it, the edgest of edge cases that you're using to try and prove your point. No, I think that the, the edge not. case, the farthest there's edge case that you're, you're using is, is actually proving the rule. Do you know what I mean? No, no. There's, the exception there's, there's, proves the rule. There's so many people out there that have like some kind of like cluster B personality type because that's a big umbrella. Like there's so many people out there with like borderline personality disorder or bipolar disorder or narcissism, borderline personality disorder. There's so many possible disorders that people could have and they all, they all do kind of fall under the same umbrella and a lot of them have the same issues of not really being able to identify the trauma that they inflict onto others. And it's so easy to manipulate and deceive. Like even Jordan Peterson, like you were talking about earlier, like one of the things he says is like impossible to even say words about manipulating. Just to, just to speak is an act of manipulation. And it's so easy to think that you're doing something in good faith and with good intentions. But like we were saying earlier, like you, these good intentions lead to hell. And like you can sit here thinking that you're doing something that's morally just, but actually maybe doing something to someone's detriment, but through the lens of thinking that you're doing something right. No, I can understand that. If you're you're doing something you think is right and you're actually har harming other people, that's um. I mean, that's, that's that happens all the time. That happens all the time. But happens to us all. Uh huh. But I sure. I would argue that with people with these cluster B personality types, 
they do that a lot because they they lack object permanence they lack a lot of the key the part of their brain is literally not developed enough to handle thinking of it in that way and they may even like go so much as like we talked about of lying to themselves where they're literally living in a false reality and they might actually genuinely see themselves as this really kind person that goes around and is like trying to like you know smooth like oh she she's just like oh she needs someone to to help her like figure she, oh she just needs to stop dressing so slutty don't worry i can fix her i can go and help her stop attracting these bad guys and really you're just gonna go in and like be a toxic piece of shit and control her and act like a son of a bitch and not even realize it because you're doing it through the lens of like you're just a help you know helpful little helper helpful little helper whatever you know whatever the case may be there's so many examples of this kind of shit all right i i uh I'm going to take a bathroom break here. We'll be right back. All right. All right, we're back. What's up, guys? Just had a little bathroom break, both of us. Yeah, nice and refreshed. I guess after this, we're going to um, play some Project Zomboid. Yeah, that was the plan. If you're still up for mm. I've been playing a lot of um, Ladder recently. It's been... It's been harsh. It's been rough, but um, you know the struggle. You know the grind. <laughs> I mean, I avoid playing ladder for certain reasons, but I, I'm very familiar with the the grind and the struggle. That's for damn sure. It's really hard to stay uh, stay positive. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, Starcraft is a uh, an unforgiving mistress and uh yeah she will, will break you down spiritually better than anyone else can right it's um yeah it's been killing me killing me slowly i think i just trying not to trying not to play too much so that i don't uh lose my my enjoyment of the game so what do you, what do you find from your perspective what what do you find difficult about how to like maintain that like stoic composure while you're playing Starcraft? Like what talk me through your like emotional state while playing and like what, what difficulties you've, you've had and tell the, tell the viewers a little bit about your experiences with the struggle. Well, Starcraft is such a, a game that's built on like a lot of very critical moments that um you're building up to throughout the game so you know there's there's a lot of like key things that you need to put together um in order to hit a certain build or to you know defend a, a certain attack and <laughs> the things that really trigger me that make me uh frustrated are when things that i know are going to happen um end up happening and and kind of ruining my my game like uh for example like uh we had a, a situation where i sussed out a opponent's build a protoss player was gonna hit me with you know a massive timing of zealots and i know that it's coming yeah. and so i've got all my buildings uh in position i've got my build set up right i know exactly what i'm doing and then the last building that i need to place to complete my wall doesn't uh doesn't build or gets blocked and then can't quite build in time and then the zealots get in and you know ravage my main do a whole bunch of damage and it's like right. very frustrating that i wasn't able to you know i was able to conceptually understand everything that i needed to do in order to find myself in a good state and then now i'm in this horrible state um, because, you know, I missed one thing, one small part of the whole puzzle was missed. Right. And now I'm in this horrible, uh, you know, situation where I have to kind of like slowly bail out my, my wa bail out the water and I'm so far behind. There's almost no chance of winning. Um, that type of situation is what just kills me is where there's, you know a million different pieces going and all of them are being juggled correctly and then one of them you know falls and the entire structure breaks you know the house of cards falls apart um yeah it's it's very frustrating to me 
Yeah, I guess like a single blunder in chess, you know, can change the entire state of the game. Just well, one major mistake can mm -hmm. be all it takes to, for everything to come crashing down, both psychologically and actually in the physical manifestation of the game state on the board or whatever. Um, yeah. So, but I mean, you you are you are a stoic. You understand these stoic principles. What is mm -hmm. it about StarCraft that makes it so hard to apply those principles compared to say something else that's frustrating? I would say it's not even really StarCraft. It's it's the combination of StarCraft and streaming at the same time. It's really, really tough. Okay. Um, like having a bunch of people uh, watching at the same time and, um, you know, giving you information and cheering you on and, you know, having other conversations while the game is going on is... Uh, it, it, it provides like a unique... Uh, amount of pressure to your psyche like <laughs> mm -hmm. putting all of those things together under pressure Gee. is very tough I, I just i imagine how rough it would be if you were like playing in a tournament you know live do or whatever you, do you think the so the main frustration stems from a need to perform like a performance-based anxiety where it's like you, you feel more frustrated because of that pressure precisely yeah, it's a combination. It's like my own um, expectation of what I can do, and then right. my like the perform the the performance aspect, and then like the 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 the, the disappointment of you know putting everything together except for one piece, and then everything falls apart. You know what I mean? And it feels yeah. the other part is it it feels like. Um, I know that it's not totally true, but it feels like the opponents don't have those same struggles in a lot of ways. Like the the way that I know there's a lot of things that are like balanced. Um, there there are things that like can go wrong for a Protoss player that can suddenly cause them to lose the game. Do you know what I mean? But it doesn't feel yeah. that way when I'm playing. A lot of the time, it's like there's a million things that if I have to control and then if I I mess up one tiny thing it's like the game is over for me but if they if they make a mistake it's like oh well they just still get damaged they still do well they they just you know a click or whatever and press press uh storm and they they kind of just get out of it it's not really a big deal you know do you think there's some perspective bias going mm -hmm. on there or do you oh, think yeah. it's literally like a balance thing as well or do you, do you see no, it as like a perspective bias there's perspective bias i'm also not doing a lot of like rushes and stuff that can kill as a uh, protoss player really early on right. so it's like i'm not putting the pressure onto them to to have like those situations where they're just going to lose if they make one mistake and that's that's yeah. kind of by my own design like i'm trying to put myself into a position where i'm you know perfecting my own game i'm not skill checking them every single game and like seeing if i can get a quick win you know what i mean like i'm trying right, i'm right. trying to have them put pressure onto me so that i, I can perfect my game it, it's kind of like i'm I'm training my i'm using them as a training tool like a random game generator yeah 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 it's like <laughs> yeah it's like i'm boxing with somebody but i'm only defending you know what i mean i i'll yeah. only defend for the first like 45 seconds so maybe they get a hit on me that they shouldn't get um and then it makes things really hard for me but i'm not i'm not taking any strikes at them so like yeah I, I, i'm getting what i'm I, i'm getting what i asked for kind of but it's just uh it's frustrating to it's frustrating to not meet my expectation and to to feel like i'm not performing properly yeah on stream now it's frustrating I feel like this. A lot of streamers fall into this trap. I think Artosis is probably like the antithesis of this, um, in the sense of they play in a very cookie cutter way. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's because of the stream. Like they want to do like one style and like keep it simple, so they can be more focused on like the chat or something. I don't know if it's like coming from that lens where they want to like you know simplify the streaming experience from their perspective. Mm -hmm. It does seem like streamers have this tendency to like fall into like a very specific way of playing, and that. At, but at the same time caring about you know performing and doing well on the stream that it causes this like weird frustration where they're creating the problem that it is making them frustrated 
like if they play like say artosis like plays and you know, he like doesn't expand much doesn't scout much he stays in his quadrant of the map the entire time and like just plays like siege expand or whatever and like you know just just plays a very linear way every time and then it like goes all to shit every time because he's like playing more reactively to the other guy throwing at him stuff like you said about like you know playing in a style that's like letting them be the aggressor and mm -hmm. reacting to that and making sure you're dotting your eyes and crossing your t's I feel like that happens a lot with streamers where they're playing in these ways. I don't know if that comes from a place of like wanting to simplify the stream experience and like playing in a more linear way that's giving you some more attention that you can spend looking at the chat or I don't know. Like for me think? it's for me it's about just uh improving. Like I'm trying to improve like I know how to do a Hydralis boss and I know how to do a 973. The the thing that I'm I'm trying to learn is to to hit these macro and like you know have mm. all the all the different spinning plates going at the same time. Um, right. There's not that many spinning plates on a nine seven three. You know, if if I just do that all the time, I'm going to uh, get myself to a really high rank where I I don't really belong. You know what I mean? Like I need to get a little bit better at spinning all the plates and then throw the 973 in there when it's needed you know what i mean when it's necessary when it's like a, a really perfect situation to utilize it uh, rather than relying on it to get wins quickly well that's I mean? just it i think like the real way of improving is identifying what your opponent is doing and then using the right tools for the job but but, but getting good at identifying when it's time to do that like mm -hmm. they'll like a, uh, there'll be a time where he'll do a build where it's like easily punished by either free hatch hydra or full hatch hydra or whatever the case may be but it's not like you have to play that way for the rest of the game like you can turn a you know a, a three hatch hydra into a five hatch hydra and so on like you don't have to obviously stay like dialed into that cheese to finish the game it could just be like a pressure build to like get going and get an advantage and then go into your normal play mm -hmm. but yeah i think that to be a really good player it's all about identifying the game state and knowing what you need to do as quickly as possible and sometimes that involves like scouting early realizing oh this guy did two gate into expo or whatever and then being like shit if i just step back and macro here i'm actually fucked because then he's gonna like actually n not be punished at all for like what he did or something and that's the thing is like there'll be times where your opponent's doing something super greedy or like something that you could react to and could punish and if you don't punish it's like you're putting yourself into a weird game state where you're making it harder for yourself. And yeah, in a way you can improve your macro and stuff. If, if you do care so much about the deliberate practice of only focusing the macro element or whatever, but the reality is to, to be like a really good player, you have to be really good at the nuances of those games. Whereas like sometimes I have to just shift into like, right, I'm going to try and kill him in the next two minutes. And so you can't kill him. Say so he does the correct response and he makes six cannons and has shit tons of army. And it's like, okay, I can't bust him, but I can contain him. So then you contain him and you make lots lots more hatcheries and you go up to your standard six hatchery production that you would anyway it's just that you got there in a different way mm. yeah it's tough and it's tough to do all that when there's people like chirping in your ear as well to like think yeah. tactically and like really think about the game state and think about what the opponent's doing um there's just a lot of noise going on in when you're um when you're streaming and uh trying to play yeah. at the same time so i find it hard but I think I'm improving over time. It's just uh, sometimes it feels like I'm I'm going backwards. Like some days, I just uh, feel really really hard to to micro, and then you know I start losing games that I shouldn't have lost uh, if I was performing properly, and yeah. it feels like I'm slipping backwards. You know, like we're going we're going down, um, back well yeah that, that that's really frustrating for me but i i know that there's like there's good days and bad days for everybody and you know yeah. bad days you gotta learn I, from as well i think also uh, like i said about earlier there, there's a lot of similarities between starcraft it's similarities between starcraft and poker and starcraft and chess but as far as poker is concerned when you're playing like especially even like if you're playing on no limit hold'em or something like you're dealing with crazy swings even when you're playing perfectly and like you're really utilizing your position well to make your decisions and you've you know you're like taking advantage taking advantage of all the, the possible data points of like how much this guy's like you know being aggressive pre-flop and all this bullshit like it, you can even if you play perfectly you can still just lose hand after hand table after table and just get completely demolished and just gone crazy lost streaks but the skill there is not how well you're 
you're playing in those individual games or those individual hands. The skill there is the psychological aspect of how you get yourself out of that lost streak. Because um, you go on tilts where you make the lost streak worse. Which, sure, maybe you were destined to lose three or five or six games in a row or whatever, but maybe that's all. But maybe because of the tilt, because of losing those three, five, six games in a row, maybe now you lose eight, nine, ten in a row because you're on tilt because you lost those other games in a row. You know what I mean? And I think this is the problem. It's the psychological aspect of being able to like re reassess and refocus after going on these lost streaks and tilts because that's the real issue is once we get upset or tilted, how do we change that? And most people can't, right? Most people just get stuck in that and then they just keep losing, losing, losing. For sure. It's the law of compounding errors. I mean, I've, I've struggled with it. I think everybody does is just, uh, you know, something goes wrong and then you're not paying attention to that. You're thinking about, uh, the, the error that you made and you're not thinking about what you're doing next. And then you're making more errors, which, you know, create more errors and it's very hard to reset. Yeah. I mean, it happens at work. It happens in, in Starcraft. It happens in daily life. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of things like that. It's, it's, it's important to learn how to let go, right? Attachment is the root of all suffering. If you can let go of your things and you can let go of your, um, your failures, your past mistakes as well. It's really important. Yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of a good uh, circle back to the original topic heading of attachment and the root of suffering. I like that. Now, do you, did you want to... I heard that you wanted to talk a little bit about recycling. Did you want to get into that now? Um. Yeah, I guess so. We're, we're getting on here in time. It's been like two hours, 15 minutes, so we'll just go quickly and, and talk about this because it's something that's been popping up in my feed a lot and it's something that I've well, been well, thinking about for talk. a long time. Speak your mind. Sure, sure. Um, I've been hearing this a lot for a long time. Is that uh, basically plastic recycling is complete dog dog shit? It's not. It's not yeah, real. There's like a two percent of actual of plastic that's been made has actually been recycled. Um, most of the plastic yeah. just ends up in the ocean or ends up in the underground or burned. Here in Japan, they just burn all their plastic and they make a lot of it. Everything is in plastic. It's kind of horrendous, actually, how much plastic they use here. Like each individual cookie, when you buy like a, a box of cookies, um, you know, the box of cookies is, is surrounded by plastic. The plas There's plastic, like a little, um, you know, the, the tray of cookies. And then each individual cookie is in a plastic wrap as well. <laughs> and it's like... There's so much fucking plastic, it's insane, and they they're just yeah. they're just burning it all here, because uh, they don't have they don't have land for landfills, right? So, um, it it it's in, kind of insane. I think it's the, one of those things that you know we we talk about it um, from the past where people will look back and and think like, how the hell did they you know you uh, you, you know, think that like bloodletting or something like that was a, a good way to treat illness or, you know, how the hell did they think that like shock therapy or like a lobotomy was a great idea to treat mental illness, you know, um, or like lead, like how the hell was everything made from lead paint, lead paint, lead this, lead that, like why, why did people think that that was a good idea? And, you know, the, what are those things in, that are happening right now in our lives that are just going to be looked back on in the future as just a terrible, terrible idea. And I think plastic is one of those, like we're learning about phthalates and stuff like that. Now we're learning about the, uh, you know, plastic leaching into your food and into your water and into everything yeah. like the chemicals, microplastics. microplastics getting into your body. We're eating, you know, a, a credit card worth of plastic every year or something like that. Right, it's going know, into your body. I don't know if that one is true, but it is true that we got loads of microplastics in our body. Loads of microplastics, and um, you know the the ocean is getting filled up with plastic, and the only thing that's been pushed to us is this whole recycling thing, right? And um, it's been complete nonsense. It's been complete bullshit. You know, like 
America, there's only been 2% of everything has been recycled. All the plastic waste has been recycled. Um, and yeah. like a very low percentage of even the shit that you uh, carefully sort out to, to be sent to the recycling plant and wash and like get ready for the recycling plant. Very little of that is ever recycled. And it feels like there's uh it, it's just like a massive scam that's been going on by the plastic industry to make it feel like it's okay, but we're actually polluting the environment insanely with all of this plastic and polluting our own bodies too, with the whole like microplastics thing. And I was you know, thinking about this, um, and I've been thinking about it for a long time, it feels like there's nothing that can be done about it, but there's this guy um, that's been coming up in my feed a lot recently. His name is uh, Nature Nature Jab. That's it, Nature Jab. Um, hmm. Like a young kid who says that he has a solution um, for plastic waste, and it's basically a uh, method using microwaves to create oil and gas from plastic and um it's pretty interesting you did you checked it out shin i checked it out um i'm not a i'm not a chemist or anything i don't know a lot about this stuff um i was a little bit dubious about the the actual like potential method. return on the inputs oh. and outputs in terms of like um yeah like how much energy is yet obviously obviously plastic's very energy dense but the actual reaction the react the, the power required to power the reactor like if he could get the biofuel that he's producing to mm. generate a power generator to make the whole thing self um, self sufficient or somehow use the gases produced by that to power some the reactor does that make sense mm. well, if he can get that down to prove that it's um, self-sustaining and there's also like you know an actual a net gain on output, then I'll be fucking impressed. I haven't seen that yet, so I, I don't know. I'm a little bit dubious, a little bit skeptical because I haven't seen a lot. I haven't done a big enough research. I only checked out a few of his videos, a little bit cursory glance. I will admit, I do not know what I'm talking about. But yeah, on the surface level, it does seem like he's onto something. But I need to see a little bit more to be like really blown away by it. But it does seem fucking interesting. And I'm actually interested about the angle that you came at um, the recycling thing. I didn't think that you were going to come at it from that angle right out of the gates and some of the points you made are actually going to be some of the points i was going to make i actually thought that i was going to have to like uh be a little bit devil's advocate and uh say the other side a little bit more but you've, you've actually attacked it in quite a, a good way yeah i would actually go i'll steal man you even further and say like i think like the yeah, traditional recycling is is basically a scam and also to like give you the consumer the perception that you're not this piece of shit that's polluting the, the earth it's literally just for optics to make you feel better about oh you put your your bottles in a separate bin oh good for you like yeah you're not as much of a toxic piece of shit that's fucking the world up you know what i mean it's kind of a little bit of that as well mm. to kind of give people this false image of like oh i'm doing my bit you know i got this feeling Reality is, yeah. yeah i got this feeling right as covid was happening i got this feeling like and I was I was thinking about making a video about this actually, but I I don't know how to frame it. And I was thinking that government, uh, since COVID and and before COVID, um, but since COVID really especially has been, uh, really focused on putting the blame basically for everything on the consumer. Do you know what I mm -hmm. mean? Where the consumer is really not responsible for any of this shit, like. There's, and, and, and the, re and recycling is a great example of it. Like basically there's so much plastic waste that has nothing to do with the consumer, right? There's huge amounts of plastic waste. Right, Most right, of the plastic waste is coming from these like massive industrial, uh, you know, companies that are just like, for example, I was working at a, a furniture store and we would throw out, you know, an entire you know, garbage bin of plastic uh, every couple of days because we're like un unpackaging all of this stuff sent to us from China. That's everything is wrapped in plastic, just massive garbage bins full of plastic every day. Like there's huge, huge plastic waste that's coming from just businesses. And the ones that are responsible for regulating those are the government, right? The government can decide 
how much plastic is enough plastic like how much is too much right for these for these companies to use and like how you know how much are they allowed to throw away how much are they allowed to use but instead they are using their power and using things like recycling to put the blame onto um the regular consumer so it's like you know why is the pla- why is the ocean fucked up why is there so much uh plastic in the environment oh it's because you didn't uh you know recycle everything you know like or not just you but your fellow man like everybody around you is not recycling enough you know what i mean instead of like well wait a second the government is really not regulating this properly they're kind of like fucking up and you know pushing the blame onto us it it gets it gets the normal average person to like look in inside of themselves rather than at the the policies that are that are actually fucking everything up yeah no i, I can agree with that i mean i i guess i could devil's advocate a little bit and give you a tiny bit of pushback and say well hang on a minute like so, um the people are in a way enabling that behavior because if they wanted to they could vote with their feet and not like you know give money to these companies that are operating in this way and mm-hmm. enabling that kind of behavior there is a little bit of that as well i think you could say but maybe there's a little bit of responsibility on the consumer but i think like you say by and large you know that there isn't that much i think a lot of times it is the policy and the lobbying that's at fault and um obviously the blame is everyone's gonna deflect blame and you know the mm-hmm. last thing to do when things go to shit is to assign blame and yeah it's, yeah. it's easy to point the finger at the consumer in this case um, but as far as this whole recycling thing is concerned, I, I don't really see like an easy solution either because like there's no financial incentive to really do anything about it. I mean, if anything, everything's done based on optics. Like like mm-hmm. the things that are done about it are literally just to look good like you're doing. Now, now it's now trendy to look like you're being environmentally friendly. You know what I mean? You mm-hmm. actually have to be that environmentally friendly just as long as you appear to be. And that's why you see on the packaging of shit in supermarkets, like all well, these, same with anything. If, if they want to make the food look more healthy, they'll be like, you know, green with like, you know, vibrant colors and everything. You know, to kind of package it, make it seem like this is a healthier option. And it's the same with anything with cycling included they 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 kind of appeal to the the humanitarian in, our, in us by like making it seem like these companies are actually doing something more ecologically friendly or whatever but the reality is usually not that much and no. usually only for the benefit of appearing to be now it's um it, it's it, it, it's like an unsolvable situation with um the the way that the the plastic industry has kind of infiltrated everything like nothing nothing is safe from plastic right now every everything that you use everything yeah. that you buy has plastic involved in it and well, uh, you know voting with your feet is one thing but like how can you go to you can't even go to the grocery store like what are you going to yeah. do like grow all your food food at home um if you want to not utilize plastic you know it's it's so tough but yeah. if there was a financial incentive to, you know, you to take back the plastic, um, I think this would that this would provide that. You know, if if you could actually get fuel out of plastic, if you could get gasoline out of plastic, then all of the plastic in the ocean is like a fuel source, right? I don't know how, like you were saying, like how energy efficient it is. Well, like, would you be able to send a like a, you know, a cleanup crew? to pick up a whole bunch of plastic and then, uh, you know, have that plastic make enough fuel to make it worth it, the the trip, to pick it all up. Do you know right. what I mean? Like, is that is that something that would be yeah. worthwhile? Um, what about, like, all the landfill plastic? Would it be worthwhile to, like, dig it out and, uh, and pick mm-hmm. it up? Because then, actually, the North American way of dealing with plastic would be kind of, uh, genius in that case like oh we just buried it all and now it's like a <laughs> it's like a you know future oil reserves do you know what i mean um, but, like do you know what you reminded me of <laughs> yeah do you know do you know george carlin the comedian george carlin mm, yeah he did like a whole whole bit about like um our purpose in life is plastic basically eventually it will all be gone and it will mm. just be the earth plus plastic right so like maybe the answer to life is plastic that's all you're good for just creating plastic maybe that's the answer to life we're just here to create plastics the world can't make it you know what i mean right those artificial but, uh, go, 
<laughs> but yeah, um, I, 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 I'm a little bit still very skeptical about this guy because I, I imagine like it doesn't. I imagine that biofuel doesn't have uh, probably has a very high flashpoint, and probably I don't. I, I can't imagine him being able to synthesize that into a, a gasoline state, which would be would which which would work well in a combustible engine. And like I don't know if like it, yeah, I don't know if like traditional like sparking methods in the engines gonna like you know ignite that fuel the same way. I think I saw one video where he was like holding a, a light, an open flame to it, and it, it you know, didn't even like light on fire, but it, he did manage to get it on fire with like a fucking full on exposure to a blowtorch. So it had a very uh, high flashpoint or whatever. But um, yeah, I don't know if he could like refine that down into something that, you know, could work in a combustible engine. I would love to see him getting a generator powered by that biofuel. Mm. And then, uh, then we can talk, I would say. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was, I, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm skeptical about it as well. Like, I don't know if it's a scam. Like, maybe he's just, you know, making this machine that's um, it's actually not doing what he's saying it's doing. Maybe he's, you know, fudging it. Who knows? The internet is a wild place right now, but it's giving me a little bit of hope. Like, hey, maybe yeah. maybe there's some sort of way that we could get out of the situation because it feels so hopeless a lot of the time when you're looking around yourself, how much plastic there is everywhere. Well, that's because everything is done in these like short term periods. Like when you're when you're in office as a president, you know, you've got at best like eight years of doing shit. Are you mm. really concerning yourself about the amount of plastic in the world? Like, is that really going to be like the impact on your like eight year term? Like people just don't because of the way society is structured. It's just you, people have not been able to think of things in that kind of time scale, right? Everyone is so and with things like TikTok and other kinds of short. Uh, format content people are even more going to not be able to think about things in that wider lens right the big picture will just they will not be able to see the forest from the trees and like that's one of the reasons why i'm so happy that we're doing a podcast because it's a long format content that's going to encourage people to actually like you know engage their brains over longer periods and actually think in a wider uh, scope in general i think there's hunger for that i think that people um especially our age have uh a hunger for more long form content and yeah it's it's good yeah. it's good for your brain to to focus on one thing for a while <clears throat> to have like um not just scrolling through through reels or whatever uh tiktoks yeah. um youtube shorts i do that youtube sometimes. shorts yeah uh, youtube shorts are pretty toxic man it's pretty pretty rough <laughs> but um, really mine aren't too bad but maybe that's just because i'm dialed in on some funny shit i don't know yeah i've been trying to uh follow the right people get more funny shit in there but uh can be pretty toxic yeah i have noticed some i have to admit like over the course of years of browsing youtube shorts like here and there like i have noticed there's some pretty crazy stuff on there for sure but um yeah, back to this guy, this uh, this young kid. I mean, how funny right. is it that there would be the, such an obvious thing like making plastic into energy would only be uh, unlocked by some kid in his backyard, you know? It wouldn't be figured out by uh, an oil company that could stand to benefit massively right. from this. It, it, you know? it, it's, a be it's a nice story. It's a beautiful narrative. But the reality is, is like, is there enough energy stored in that energy rich plastic to create a self sustaining reaction to, you know, maintain that? Because otherwise, it doesn't produce, if it doesn't produce enough energy to maintain its own reaction to harvest that energy, then it's pointless, right? right. It has to also obviously have to be able to output more than mm -hmm. it takes to harvest it. So that's what we got to see. Um, well, until we see that, it's a little bit of a pipe dream. But it would be a beautiful story if it turned out. Hang on a minute, the answer's been under our nose all the time. We just fucking use the plastic, guys. I don't know. Also, I don't know what the the, re the chemical reaction of that does to the atmosphere as well. I don't know if the if the process of harvesting that plastic causes like more toxic fumes to be admitted into the atmosphere and like other kind of like you know particles per million. That's maybe not so good for humans. I don't know. But um, yeah, who knows? But the jury's still out, but I'm curious. I'm very, I'm skeptical, but curious and excited at the same time. Yeah. I mean, in this world right now, 
with so many scams, so much fakeness going on, it's it's really hard to tell if anything is real. Right. Like we the it's it's funny, it's like um have you ever heard of um oh, what's it called? Um like there's nineteen nineteen eighty four or nineteen yeah, nineteen eighty four that book. But then there's another one like Aldous Huxley, um, Brave one? Brave New World. You ever heard of that? Oh, Brave New World. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not too familiar with it, but I, I, I've had it referenced a lot of times. And so, yeah. It's sort of like the the opposite kind of thought um, where like in, in 1984, it's all about like fear and hatred is how they, how the one world right. government like controls you, you know, or the, the, yeah. the big brother controls you. But in Aldous Huxley, yeah. Brave New World, it's like, pleasure and you know the you take soma the pill like you're just so you know happy all the time you're not even thinking you're not even questioning you know what's going on in reality and then parallel to the mm -hmm. matrix right right so the utopian matrix and the not one right but i'm I'm thinking about it in a different way like the the matrix is like a totally fake world that is like pulled over your eyes right but like in our reality right now it's kind of like the inverse of the matrix where like there's so much weird scammy shit in front of you that you can't see the real world because it's just yeah you can like in the matrix nobody could tell that it was fake you know what i mean they all believed it because it was so realistic but in our world it's like you can't tell anything's real you can't tell anything's real because everything's so fake (laughs) you know what i mean it's the opposite yeah yeah. (laughs) Well, maybe that's by design who knows maybe that's like to try and stop you from being able to like get in touch with like your deeper inner true inner self and also to prevent you from being able to have the authentic human connectivity and keep everyone as isolated and vulnerable and divided as possible so they're easier to control and maintain that's the that's the the reality of the matrix of our time you know like it's the aldous huxley that's the the matrix is like the 1984 and the the aldous huxley version is um is our reality right now it's fucking weird strange but we're trying to strange new world we're trying to parse things out and like that's maybe that's what we're we're going for with this uh podcast is trying to like reach some deeper truths you know what i mean Rather than, <laughs> i mean and I'm like a truth seeker Sam. what about you going, going after truth yeah yeah trying to figure out like what's real and <clears throat> yeah welcome to the desert of the real It's a Morpheus quote from Matrix 1, isn't it? When he's like in the TV, and he's like in the, the storm in the background. He's like, welcome to the desert of the real, I think. No? Yes, I think so. Mm-mm. We don't know who struck first, but we know we blotted out the sun. Oh, yeah. Because the, 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 the AI was... the sky. Scorched, scorched the sky. Scorched the sky. Yeah. Because the AI was relying on solar power, solar energy. Yeah. And that's how they segue into the you know, battery. Us using us for batteries thing, which is such a dumb angle, man. Like, so stupid. Like, the amount of energy required to keep the humans alive related to the amount of output that they would, based on their body heat, is just ridiculous. Okay. Ridiculous. The hive need- mind thing. Way more powerful. We need to we need to write like a Matrix sequel sequel man like where the Neo to it, man. Neo figures <laughs> out he's like wait a second that's yeah. that's not enough power you're not generating enough power to be worth it and then realizes that actually he's still in the Matrix and it's <laughs> it's actually the neural net <laughs> the neural net is even the, like the deeper layer of the Matrix. Yeah, <sighs> man, I had I had. What do you what do you think about like the theory of like the do you know the multiverse theory? What's your what's your opinion about that? Real quick, we don't have to go too much into it, but like, do you, do you subscribe to the multiverse theory? Like, lots of parallel universes, or what? What, what you, what's your opinion about that? Hmm. I don't know. It's that's a that's a well, difficult question, man. That's like. To me, Can I it's... frame it differently. Okay. Let's 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 do an analogy. Now, what if 
hypothetically, you could think of those parallel universes as like subjective realities in the sense of, you know, like we're talking about, like everyone's got their own truth, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the same way as you've got your own truth and your own worldview and your bubble of existence, the same as everyone else has got their own bubble of existence. Now, what if those bubbles, those existences, those points of consciousness are their own separate realities existing at the same time? And you can think of that multiverse in the same way, where it's like these a multiverse of universes, universe, you being the opportune pun intended word, you as that individual universe. So your own subjective reality could be thought of as a universe that's working in parallel with all these others that are connected to the multiverse. Uh, if that helps you be a better person, then I would say you can believe in it. I, I'm like a true stoic man. I just think that you know, thinking about what whatever you're thinking about, it should be with the with the goal of making yourself better. You know what I mean? Of of becoming yeah. a better person. And if it's not something that you can um affect, if well, it's not something that affects you, then it's it's like kinda like the the multiverse theory kind of is like the um the the AI theory, like the the what's it, the um like thinking that the whole world is a, a simulation, like simulation theory. Do you know what I mean? Like, okay, no. but if it is a simulation, if it isn't a simulation, does it change my life at all? No, like I'm still going to act the same way that I'm going to act. So why would I even think about it? You know what I mean? Well, I think that there's a lot of overlap between, look, looking at it from like a Venn diagram between you and me, I think there's a lot of overlap between how we see the world and what we think about things but mm -hmm. one thing that makes us interesting is there's also a few very key things on that we really differ and diverge on and mm -hmm. you just touched upon one very specific thing that i think that makes us an interesting dynamic is one thing i really do not go in that direction on is when you say about the the being better angle like mm -hmm. you know just about focusing on being better kind of thing um, and and from my lens obviously i'm not saying mine is right and yours is wrong i'm just saying from my perspective i have the angle of like the i don't see it like that's possible i see it as like to, to try and be better is like already setting yourself up to not be able to because who's the one doing the bettering like you're trying to improve yourself with yourself and that's like an impossible task almost it's not like you're able to be an ai that has two versions of itself and has one version to like error check and make a slightly improved version then that makes another improved version which does an error check and makes that a slightly more improved version and back and forth it goes like a ping pong to improve itself to reach some kind of like technical singularity to rapidly advance we can't do that as humans right so in a way i disagree from that that for that lens because I, I don't i don't see that as being possible like i see that as like a being like a, a trap almost so you're not able to better yourself is what you're saying with yourself like you're not able to bet yourself with yourself because who's the one doing the bettering who's the one judging what is better i would say that this is literally the only thing that you can do you cannot make things outside of you better like you you can't like improve on someone else. You know what I mean? You can't, the, know, the only uh, thing that you can maybe, better is yourself. Maybe, maybe there's a misunderstanding here. What I'm trying to say is that I wouldn't come at it from the framework of bettering. I think that the act of thinking about making something better is, is, is the issue, the hang up, not, not the, the method, but the actual, the, 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 the framing of bettering. Right. Because you don't think that better, like there's, there's any, like, uh, what's it called? Like, uh, subjective better or um, objective better. Do you know what I mean? That's what you were saying before. We, is like who yeah, who I, says that this is better than that? You know what I mean? Yeah. Who says that yeah, that's the this thing. is right and that's wrong? And the only answer is that like you intrinsically know that this is better, like based based on just being a human how, being. Like, but based on you. Yeah. For for example, is it better that I, uh, you know, work out today instead of not working out at all? You know what I mean? Is that it, better? I guess that it's nuanced as well, though, right? Because maybe like you need a rest day, so it depends, right? But if you just mean like in terms of like, is it better in the sense of like, will I see benefit of doing that? Mm -hmm. Like, will my body be more prepared for physical stresses in the future or whatever? Yeah, you, you could argue that. I mean, there's definitely arguments to be made for that in, in some cases, but I, I still think on a deeper level, 
I think coming at it from that lens of like being better anything already is coming from a place of not enough already is coming from a place of insecurity already is coming from a place of attachment already is coming from a place of being rooted in suffering is what I'm trying to get at. Like if you just don't try to better yourself, then I guess you're just completely okay with what you are. I think that that's that, that like mentality has already played itself out in our society. Like, the whole like oh so. you're fine as the way that you are you're you're already great you know what i mean like that whole mentality has kind of like showed itself to be incredibly detrimental to the youth of our time like it's been horrible like you don't need to uh, you, you don't need to improve on anything you're perfect just the way you are that type of mentality is is it's not good for anybody you need to uh, yeah okay supposing that you could be better is like coming from a place of like not being perfect, but nobody's perfect and re recognizing that you can be better and that you have the power to make yourself better is the most empowering thing, you know? And, and it's totally, it's totally true. You can make yourself better. Um, and whatever, you know, better is in your own mind, that's what is better. You know what I mean? Like being able to, uh, not lie you know what i mean if you're if you're gonna be lying all the time um and you make the choice the conscious decision that i'm going to not lie now i'm going to you know speak the truth and i'm going to you know take care of my family i'm going to you know uh be uh, you know an honest person that's in my mind that would be better in the person's mind that would be better so that makes it in, like obviously intrinsically better you know i don't like the meta analysis of of what is better and what's not better it doesn't really help anything it doesn't really help me to become you know a uh, fully realized human being i'm <laughs> so like the meta analysis is is not useful in my mind I'm not necessarily saying you have to subscribe to it. I'm just like expressing my religious beliefs and stuff. Like I'm just expressing like how I view things. Like mm. it's not like anyone has to think this way or anything. I, I certainly don't think. If anything, my my beliefs actually say the opposite. My beliefs say that I have nothing to teach you, and you have nothing to learn. You have nothing to teach me, and I have nothing to learn because the answers are all inside. And it's the experience that realizes that. So when you're t when you're talking to someone that you're considering a teacher, and you're considering yourself a student really you're the one that's dictating those roles you're the one that's living life through that lens it doesn't have to be that way it could just be two human beings having an experience that helps you realize something about yourself and to, mm. to put any labels on it as unnecessary it's not so much that you don't go to the gym to better yourself you can be fine the way you are and still go to the gym because you like going to the gym but you're coming at it from the framing of not trying necessarily i'm going to make myself into a better version you're coming at it from the framing of i like going to the gym i'm going to show up to the gym Enjoy but going I don't, to the gym. I don't like going to the gym. I don't like exercising. I would rather just like okay, sit in my chair like, and do nothing. Like the process of going, but, maybe, but maybe you like that. Maybe I don't you like, like, it. like doing something. But I don't well, then like don't it. Do it. Be, true, no. then be true to your nature. I do because I like the result. I like feeling there better. You go. But that's what I'm saying. You like the process. You like the result. That's why you do it. So you enjoy it. It's just you don't you don't like you don't like the actual physical act of going to the gym, but you like the result of it. So you like the process of it. You like the reward of it. Mm -hmm. So you still like it. You still enjoy it. You still can do it without the requirement of needing to be better. You can still just enjoy it and do what you want to do and be authentic. I really <laughs> I really don't get your philosophy, man. I'm I'm lost. But um Well, we could do a don't... deep dive on Zen <laughs> philosophy at some point if you want. <laughs> but we would need a whole. We'll probably need to do like a whole episode on Zen philosophy. To be honest with you, and it, and and like like uh, someone like Alan Watts would say, it could take you a second to get it, or it could take you a lifetime. But like you know, no one knows for sure. It could take someone ten years to get it, or fifteen years to get it, or twenty years to get it, or they never get it. Well, they get it in ten seconds of being introduced to what Zen is. Maybe they get it right away. I still haven't gotten it. Right. Yeah, I what what you're saying about like not being a teacher or not or just being a human, I would say like it's better to look at everybody as a a teacher. Like everything is a teacher to you, not just people. Like every moment is a teacher. 
right every every everything that's happening yeah yeah you're you are a student otherwise like if you want to but because you're learning that interferes but what what if that interferes well so let's say hypothetically you you wanted to be a student and learn something from me but i was looking at it from the world of oh everyone's my teacher so when i was engaging with you i was looking at you as my teacher and you were looking at me as your teacher and we're getting cross words and we're actually having that like connection that you're looking for it's okay. You're you can tell me something without being my teacher. You know what I mean. You're telling me um, about your philosophy. You're not teaching me your philosophy, and I might still learn something without you trying to teach it. You know what I mean. <clears throat> That's just it. I think I feel like it should be more organic, where you're not having to play those roles. Because especially for my my for my philosophy, as long as you're coming to me with that intent, if you come to me with the intent of I'm a student, you're a teacher, or I'm a teacher, you're a student, that tells me that you you haven't gotten it. So all all I know for for a fact is that I still need to keep you playing that game so i might engage of you as that role i might engage of you as a teacher or as a student but i i'm consciously aware that i'm just wearing a hat i'm just playing this part because i know deep down i don't need to be this for you i know that you already could figure this all out without anything me, me saying anything but you want to like play this game of like i got something to learn you got something to teach like no, then i'm just gonna no. humor you and like give you no. like little games to, 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 to figure out that's like wrong. say that you gotta no what i'm saying is like okay maybe i know something that you don't know i'm gonna teach you that but i'm still approaching it as a student like in my explanation of of what i'm what i'm gonna say to you and in your like understanding of that i could still learn something Whereas if I just put on the hat of being a teacher, like, okay, I'm going to teach you something. And then I'm not even, I'm not even really like open to learning anything, then I'm not going to learn anything. But every situation, even if a teaching situation is an opportunity to learn. Like if I teach somebody about uh, even English, I'm a f uh, native speaker of English and I teach that to somebody else. And then they are like, you know, recognize like, oh, but why, why do you say it like that? then I might learn like, oh, shit, yeah, why do I say it like that? And then I, I learn something. Do you know what I mean? I'm not coming into it like, I, I you know, I'm just faking that I'm a teacher and I'm making things, you know, I'm putting on a charade to like, uh, you know, actually learn something. I just keep an open mind to always be knowing that every, I can learn from any situation. Do you see what I'm saying? Kind of. But I, but back to what we were talking about originally, like at the start of the podcast, about like say people putting on a persona when they stream or something. Sure. Um, I think what, what I'm trying to say is from my 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 point of view, my my religious context. I'm saying that um, I don't have that same view. Like I don't see it as like well, I see it as like we're playing a role when I when I'm being Jean, when I'm being my name given to me at birth. Right, I'm not going to say my full name and start talking about my when I'm when I'm being this person, that is playing playing a role. I'm playing because one thing I can tell you is, let's say hypothetically, your parents know that you act and operate a certain way, and uh, say you start to act outside of that. Uh, your kids would say out of pocket. You start to act out of pocket, right? And then your parents would go, hey, hey, that's not like you. Why are you acting that way? Go back to acting how we you know we've come to know you to act and that's the thing is that we get kind of like put into these boxes and yes sure some of us are more independent than others and we still break out of those boxes with sigma male all that bullshit but um reality is is that a lot of the time we're, we're still socially conditioned to act and function a certain way based on these identities and th this identity you saying you that you this person this is like a, an identity a hat you're wearing if you will the same way as like i don't see myself as actually a teacher or actually a student i see that as just a role that i'm playing the same way as i'm playing my role in the world and how i function in society that's still a role i'm playing does that help you to function better or function at all in, in society Absolutely. thinking of it that way then i mean then that's good 100%. then go for it man that's what i'd say is you know, the thoughts that come into your head, like the, the contemplation that you have about um, the world, um, a lot of it is just unnecessary garbledy gook, like the news, you know what I mean? Learning about 
what's going on in America or American politics or, you know, crazy um, wars that are happening that have nothing to do with you. The, those extrinsic information, that, that sort of like thing that occupies your mind, if it's not valuable to you functioning properly in the world, then then it's not uh it's not useful and you shouldn't be th you don't you don't need to think about it you can you can focus on other things that are uh for your own betterment that'll that'll help you to become a better person and by becoming a better person you're you're creating a better world um and that's literally all that you can do as a human being is become better um you, you know you're not you're not going to be changing the world you're not going to be changing other people there's literally only one thing that you can do is become become a better human and by doing that and a lot of people doing that is going to make the world a better place that's that's what i believe i mean i, I don't necessarily think that it's, it's like ill intention to what you said or anything but i do also think that it, it leaves a lot of room for issues uh, i feel like people coming at it from that angle seems like it, it can cause all kinds of hangups and um, keep people in certain places. There'll be some, there'll be lots of times where that's like a really healthy thing for someone to do. I just don't think it's like a, a catch all for every single person. I think it's a philosophy that's going to work well for every single human being. I can see it maybe like really being a good philosophy for maybe, I don't know, 50, 60% of humans. Maybe the rest need a slightly different angle to, for, to get the result they want. I think like some people wouldn't be able to like really grow with that mindset because like maybe one of their biggest issues is like self-esteem and self-love and stuff and if they come at it from the lens of still not being good enough then they'll never feel like they're good enough no matter what external things they 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 change there will be times you were saying earlier about how there's people that like have this mentality of like they're already perfect blah blah, blah. But that's not really what i mean when i say like being like being feel like you're enough it's not that you don't feel like you you could like do something and like you know get more physically fit or something it's just that you're just comfortable in your own skin and you're not operating from it from a lens of like i need to be someone else it's like you're comfortable enough with yourself to just be authentic so if you feel like going to the gym and getting in shape you go to the gym and get in shape if you feel like doing that you do that and that's just it that's all i'm saying I see what you're saying is you're coming from like a perspective of a person who's like not fully okay with who they are. Right. Maybe they're depressed. Maybe they're like um, falling apart, you know, mentally. They're not quite uh, capable of um, just being as a human being, just being right. Uh, alone is difficult enough or not being alone but being uh as a as an entity in this world is just difficult for them because they're not happy mm -hmm. with who they are and what i would say to that is that the reason that you're not happy with who you are is because you're not bettering yourself if you are a person who is uh, you know working towards being better you're going to be much much happier than if you're just you know, sitting at home, you know, not working on yourself, not in improving yourself, you're going to be miserable, right? I agree. Like I agree. But I, I still think that that, that 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 mindset lacks nuance, much in the same way an athlete, like we were talking about earlier, like he can strive for the gold medals and try and like his whole life become better and better and better, finally leading up to getting these gold medals. And they finally get this these arbitrary goals and then they're majorly depressed because everything was structured around the betterment. Everything was structured around the accolades of getting to a certain level, like getting fit enough or getting good enough or getting rewarded enough or whatever. The, the point is, is that you're focused on one thing so so intrinsically that even if you do get that thing, you've then just set yourself up for even deeper depression because you're, you're so you need a more nuanced balanced view of things i don't think it should be like you're honed in on like unless you want to go all the way in like a charles bukowski sense and you want to be the best fucking drummer that there ever was and you want to like be the next buddy rich or something then maybe yeah you need to be a little bit more obsessive and a little bit unhealthy about your the way you go about it because that's the only way that you can operate in that world is by being in that world fully 
committed i'm like don't even care if you end up sleeping on park benches for a week because that's what it takes to make it that kind of attitude of course there's like unhealthy ways of thinking that are actually necessary to operate in certain ways in certain fields but the reality is for the, the average person that kind of mentality can be a little bit toxic well i understand what you're saying a little bit better now i think is like the betterment of yourself or what you're doing, like you're saying about drumming or something like that, or becoming like an amazing athlete. That's not really the betterment that I'm talking about. I'm talking about like being a better human being, you know, being more balanced, being more, uh, you know, detached from emotional responses. Like we were talking about before, like being able to handle people, you know, hating on you or, you know, treating you badly without, uh, reacting and attacking or, uh, you know, lashing out at people because you've been hurt. You know what I mean? If you've, if it's something sp bad has happened to you, you're able to, you know, not take, you're able to take the high road. You're able to not react to other people. Like this is, this is what I'm talking about. Betterment is like, not about like one specific goal of, you know, becoming super wealthy or becoming like a perfect athlete or something like that. I'm talking about being a better human being, like being able to, you know, connect with people, being able to, um, you know, not lie, being able to, uh, you know, do the right thing in difficult circumstances. This is, this is like the, the type of betterment that I'm talking about. Like, this is like the stoic betterment, isn't you know it, what I'm talking about? Isn't it, it, here's an interesting um paradox though like mm -hmm. let's say what do you value more do you value honesty or, th or authenticity more mm, that's a good question i don't know maybe yeah i don't know honesty i guess authenticity okay, so let's see. yeah i well, i'm not pick, sure pick, pick which one pick which one and i'll propose something to you sure honesty okay so Let's say in this case you value honesty mm -hmm. more. Okay, now now here's the thing. What if what if someone was in a situation where, you know, he was tempted to lie to you mm -hmm. and uh he could choose to be his authentic self and lie to you in that moment and then later backtrack and be like, Hey, you know what, I was telling a porky pie there, blah blah blah. Either way depending on how he comes at this, he could come at you in different ways and maybe you would react differently to him based on your values, right? Because you might, like you say, value honesty more, authenticity more. But let's say you valued, let's say that wasn't true and you valued authenticity more. Would you prefer him to be authentic and lie because that's more authentic to him to, to be what he is intrinsically? Maybe he tells you the truth later on, but in that moment, he really wants to, he really feels like he needs to lie for whatever reason. He tells this lie to be authentic to himself. And uh, do, you, do you think, what do you think about that? Like, do you, what do you think about the nuance there? Based on, do you think based on your values only dictate the what's going on there? So are you the arbiter there based on your worldview? Are you acting as God and saying like, well, because of my beliefs, this is okay and this isn't okay? Or how do you view that? I would say that I've never told a lie because I was being authentic to myself. So I don't know what you're talking about, or I can't imagine a situation where I would lie authentically. This doesn't really make sense to be authentic to myself. Every time I've lied well, say, has always well, been hang on, hang on. for like a, a, a selfish well, reason. It's always a selfish well, reason why you would lie. I guess, yeah. Uh, Maybe, but okay, there, 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 might be, there, might, there might be a time where, say, let's say someone, I can think of a few examples where maybe there's a bit more nuance here. You can still give me pushback and disagree, but I've got, I've got other examples. Um, let's say there's a, 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 there's a guy in a relationship and he cheats on his girlfriend or his wife and like uh, he realizes it's a bad thing to do and he stops and he never does it again. And that's like his way of apologizing is by like being like, holy shit, I fucked up. I'm never going to do that again. Uh, it, he could then tell her later on, let's say years down the line, oh, by the way, I did this thing. But isn't that like selfish in a way because he's the one that's getting it off his chest to feel better and he's just causing her undue hurt by being honest? Mm. 
I would say that uh, it's better to tell the truth because basically hiding that fact is you're not being your authentic self to that person, right? That person doesn't know who you actually are. You're actually a cheater. Like you, you did yeah. something horrible and that person who loves you is not looking at you as what you really are. They're looking at you as a faithful, you know, husband who's been with them the entire time. Um, and you're you're deceiving them, right? They they're not actually in love with you. They're in love with the the image that they have of you, which you've presented to them by lying to them and cheating behind their back. So by by revealing the truth to them, um, you're actually giving them an opportunity to see who you really are and actually make a decision yeah. like by by lying to them you're taking away their autonomy to make a decision based on the truth right based on what is actual fundamental reality you're you're obscuring reality from their vision and you know by telling them the truth you're giving them the actual choice between whether they want to be with you or not okay but let's say hypothetically you were going to break up with this person okay and you had like the option of like coming clean and, and being like and part as, as part of your closure to the relationship or, or leading up to breaking up with them you'll be like you want to come clean because you feel so bad or whatever isn't that still selfish though because like all you're really doing is like hurting this person to make yourself feel better because you got it off your chest yeah i don't think it's nice i don't think it's very good either way like tell them at the end of the relationship chip tell them you know when it actually happened it still sucks but um i mean if you're just doing like it to hurt them tell them you tell them when you do it i feel yeah. like if you're gonna tell them you tell them when it happens and yeah. i feel like if you don't i feel like if you leave i think if, if you leave it long enough it becomes a point of no return where you're only telling them is gonna hurt them at that point mm -hmm. yeah well i mean you're at least get it you can't act in a way that's like with thoughts of everything that's happened up until that point, like you have to let go of the past and make a decision from right now. So like if you've been hiding your cheating for 10 years and you're in this relationship and you're thinking like, Oh, it's past the point of no return. I've already lied for 10 years. You know, I've hid, hidden this for 10 years. It's like, uh, you know, no, no harm in letting it go for a little bit longer. You know, it's like, you have to act from that moment. You know, what would make life better? Would it be speaking the truth and, you know, allowing the person that you love or uh, that maybe, you know, that you've been with all this time? Maybe you don't love them. I'm mm -hmm. not sure. But you are al allow them to have the opportunity to to know who you actually are, to be your authentic self, to know who what you've actually done, you know? Or is it better, mm -hmm. you know, it's it, it just... To me, it's it's obviously better to be your authentic self, right? And I, I can't imagine a situation where lying is being true to your authentic self. Okay, well, I can think of a I can think of a situation for me personally. Now okay. speaking now now I can speak from personal experience. Maybe it's been more accurate. Uh, so there was a situation where my my father. Um, was like basically dying in hospital from um pancreatic cancer and it was like a surprise because pancreatic cancer is like asymptomatic for a long time until mm -hmm. like right at the end where you're fucked basically so had like a period of like a week or two of like processing everything and finding out about it and dealing with it and i was in a taxi on the way home from the hospital at one point and it was and uh he taxi was like well-intentioned guy and he was like talking about it he kind of got the vibe something what was going on because he then was quizzing me about you know what was going on and he kind of got the vibe that i was, I was seeing my dad in hospital he didn't know how serious it was but he was kind of talking to me and like uh, oh yeah well you know i hope he gets better soon and all that kind of thing meanwhile like i know he's fucking dying mm -hmm. and it, it was my, in my authentic self in that moment to act like yeah maybe we'll get better soon you know so, yeah, I'm, 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 yeah because i i, I don't want to fuck this guy's day up i don't want to like bring the mood down and fuck his day up and it wasn't in my authentic self to get into it and be a depressive and be like oh fuck i'm, I'm so fucked my dad's dying kind of thing like fuck me kind of thing it wasn't authentic for me to act like that i just wanted a normal human interaction where i could just talk to this cabbie 
like you know just you know doing my shit and that was authentic to me to kind of lie to him and make it seem like everything was chill and that my dad might be all right i get that i'm not saying you did anything wrong by uh by lying in that moment um especially to a stranger who's who's not going to be affected by your lie in a lot of cases like i mean i have my own rules for when i it's okay for me to lie and i know that i talked about like Oh, I, I never lie, but there are obviously exceptions that are unavoidable. For me, it's like there's if there's a, a uh for example, a really big secret that I have to keep to protect somebody that I care about, then I will lie to protect that secret. For example, like what if my friend was like was gay or something like that, you know what I mean? Um, and you know, he really didn't want his parents to find out and his parents start kind of quizzing me about their son. You know, I would lie in order to keep his secret. You see what I'm saying? Like I would, I would, yeah. I would, uh, because me just saying like, sorry, I don't want to talk about it is already kind of like an admission. You know what I mean? Like I would have to lie in order to, um, keep the secret for the friend right because i want to be somebody who's trustworthy for for secrets keeping like if somebody if somebody i love somebody i care about has a secret that they want to share with me like i want to be okay as the person that they divulge that in like not somebody that's going to leak that to the people that they don't want it to know about right so yeah. that's that's one of my exceptions the other exception is uh, if I'm talking to the police, if I'm talking to the police, I don't give a shit. I'll lie. I, I honestly don't care because they have massive power over you and they, like you have no power in that situation. Um, they like, for example, like crossing over to, into the United States border, uh, and they ask you like, do you ever smoke marijuana? Like, yeah, I'm going to say no, fuck. I don't, I've never smoked it before in my life. Of course, officer. Because I don't want to get banned from going into their country. Do you see what I'm saying? Or like I, yeah. yeah. So of course, lying to the police, that is uh, completely acceptable in my in my uh, uh, belief system. Basically, um, keeping a secret, lying to the police, those are acceptable lies in my mind. And maybe for you, you know, talking to a complete stranger and just not wanting to burden them with some shit that's going on in your life that's an acceptable lie to you i don't see that as being like tremendously detrimental so that that's fine right but <laughs> deceiving deceiving somebody like i never want to deceive somebody is basically the um the principle behind the the rule do you know what i mean and i'm all about principles like the principles are the most important thing whatever your your principles are that's what you need to defend and and try to up, uphold is the principle. Yeah. It's not the the hard and fast rule of whatever you're trying not to do. Like, for example, we were talking earlier about, like, um, turning the other cheek, right? Like, someone's being an asshole to you and just, like, not, not reacting, you know, just being kind, being friendly, and, like, just not not uh allowing them to drag you down into their game right of course there's the that's the principle the principle is you know not allowing others to control your mental state right like if they're uh gonna be a shitty person like you're not gonna allow that to affect you you're not gonna allow them to control you by controlling your emotions yeah. um but of course if they are gonna get like violent with you if they're gonna get like really aggressive then you need to defend yourself, right? And so you you have to like amp up to their level to to get ready to to fight or flight, right? So there's there's mm -hmm. it doesn't break the principle, um. That those situations, there's just uh yeah, there's nuance like you're saying. Yeah, I agree. I think that, but I think the the point is is that most of these situations people are lacking the nuance to navigate them i think that's like you can see that reflected in starcraft like people are following build orders and whatever but 
they're not necessarily like looking at the deeper nuance and the timings of things and how that correlates and why they're doing things at a certain time and what have you and uh, in relation to what you were saying about not letting people control your mental state i think um mike tyson talked a little bit about that and he was talking about how um when you let someone change you it's like you're letting them become your master mm -hmm. i yeah. think that that's the that's the, that's the intrinsic thing is like if their toxicity or their shit talking, whatever, is actually changing you and making you act in an out of accordance, out of accordance with who you are. Here's the thing: let's say it's in your nature to banter, then I think it's okay to engage more. Whereas if it's not in your nature to banter, let's say you don't banter at all normally, then maybe you should be true to your nature and not engage. Is what I would say. The nuance view I would have is like I feel like you should be more true to your nature no matter what. So if you're the kind of guy to banter a little bit, then I say you should banter a little bit. If you're the kind to not not banter, not not give anyone any shit, then you don't do that as well, and you stay true to who you are regardless of what any other motherfuckers doing. Hmm. Well, it all comes back to StarCraft, man. That's what it is. The Doom Drop <laughs> show. Doom Drop pod. Don't let those filthy Protoss players on ladder talk shit to you and change your mental state, take control of you, force you to be on tilt. Just let it slide. Let it go by. Don't like, uh, like thoughts when you're um, meditating. Just let them flow down the river in your mind. Yeah. Yeah, you guys can wake up tomorrow and believe whatever you want to believe and realize you don't have to believe in any of this Zen crap. You're mm -hmm. in control of your own lives. <laughs> All right, well, we've passed three hours, man. I think we should probably wrap this up. Hey, man, I'm good to wrap up now if you want to. All right. So, guys, this is it. Episode number two. We went down some deep rabbit holes here. Um... We saw just how far, how deep the rabbit hole goes. It's uh, it's deep, man. There's a lot of shit going on down there. Yeah, man. it's a lot of shit going on down there. We need to take a little deep dive sometime. And we'll be back next week for episode number three. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Nice. Thanks for all the comments on the last uh, on the last episode. It's nice to read. I'm glad that we've got better sound quality here. I hope you guys are enjoying it. Make sure to yeah. leave us some more comments. See what. Let us know what you guys want us to talk about too, as well. Um, we're Absolutely. always looking for new ideas. We're like bouncing back and forth throughout the week, trying to figure out what we want to talk about. But just whatever comes to mind, I guess we'll find a yeah. we'll find yeah. a way to weave it into a conversation. Yeah, even if it's just like a little talking point or something, be nice. We'll, we'll happily be your mouthpiece if you want to put something out there. Or just be a little culture hacker and you want to like have your little two cents on what's going on in the world or whatever. You know, just shoot it our way and uh, we'll try and give it a little bit of a platform. And uh, even if we don't necessarily agree with what you're saying, who knows? Maybe I'll devil have, devil's advocate for you a little bit. You know, maybe give us give give Saiyan like a pseudo opponent to argue against, so he can like show you why your worldview is wrong or something by arguing against me. You know what I mean? Sounds good. Let's get, let's wrap this up. <laughs> Everybody. All right, guys. Well, you, yeah. We love you. I love you. We'll see you in the next one. Peace. Peace.